<laughs> oh goodness. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Blake Richardson. A pleasure. Busiest man alive, maybe. Uh, well, yes. Yeah, no, no, absolutely not. <laughs> I thought of it for a second. I was like, I'm gonna ride it. No, I couldn't, couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. You're doing some shit though. Doing some things. I'm gonna write it off. Uh, actor. Comedian. Yeah, throw a lot like okay, that. <laughs> so Character, you know, comedian, right. chauvinist, <laughs> philanthropist, <laughs> juggler, whatever things. Actor, comedian, um, jiu jitsu god, yeah, full go. specimen. What? See, see why I couldn't do it myself. Basically, a husband. Yes! You're really ticking a lot of boxes. I'm husbanding pretty hard. Pretty hard, yeah. How do you fucking manage all this? Uh, just be incredibly average across the board. That's the key. You know, yeah, you spread yourself as thin as possible to get to as many points. Yeah, and then like hang out with people who are really good at those individual things and then just kind of ride the coattails, you know what I mean? Just always be in the background like the jut, the grudge in photos. Just like, oh, there's Blake again. Why is he just fucking succubusing on every successful person? Rising tide raises all shit. Right? That's what I'm hoping. I got a little dingy. I oh, hope it gets yeah, right. I hope yeah. it gets right. Oh, it's selling it mediocrity. Oh, yeah, I man. So yeah, just trying to do a bunch of stuff. I think, you know, I've done some introspection on it uh, over the last year and a bit. And I think, I've mentioned it before on, on our pod, but it's like, I think I just, I just wanted to be special so bad, bro. Like just so bad. I wanted to be seen. And I always thought it was normal. And since I've grown up, I'm like, oh, that was, that was a, probably a lot more than everyone else. So I think you wanted that validation. Like, it's just crazy. But I think especially with social media emerging and like just celebrity culture and like the gross aspects of that, I just saw so much of myself in it. Like just elements of that. Like just wanting to just, yeah, at any cost, at any cost, I'll be anything. Please just love me. Notice me. So I think I just set on a path of like, acting looks like you know, that gets lots of love and attention. And then I just found, and luckily along the way I just enjoyed some of the processes. Otherwise, I just don't think I'd still be going. So you were not like a drama kid in school. You weren't interested in it at that point. Uh, I think I did drama in like year ten or eleven, like in upper school. Is that um, you like drama, or is that just like girls were doing drama? Yeah, no, I wasn't even that. That's actually a way better story. I was like, so many <laughs> ladies were doing it. I thought I'd jump in. I was just, I still was thinking. I was like, I just, I think I just need to figure out how to. How to become special. I wasn't good at sport, 100%. I, I never did any sport in school. I sucked. All the guys in, in high school that were cool were like surfers and like skaters and stuff like that. And I'm just the most uncoordinated, uncoordinated man with a, with a ball or a board. So that was Australia just being popular in Australia. Cross Conventionally out, crossed. Yeah, yeah, I was just like, well, that's all the things that they like. <laughs> so I'm fucked. Um, so yeah, then I just figured, I was like, oh, I just always talked a lot of shit. I just always talked a lot of shit to my family, always told stories and stuff. So I just, the natural, I guess, progression of that was, I think I could maybe be an actor. And I just started telling people I was gonna be an actor way before, way, 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 way before. Was this like high school Oh yeah. Just lying about shit too, just being like, yeah, I'm signed. But like to who, I'm like, a a actors, actors place, <laughs> actors management. Uh, pretty big, pretty big over there. Just lying about shit all the time and then, uh, yeah, just fucking kind of just light my way into better, better actually do something. I remember actually the first thing I did, so I did drama in high school and I won like the highest achiever award for it. Like, cause the practical I was always pretty good at, but the written side of things, I just, I just did, it was just nonsense. It was just, they talk about standards like, do you guys know a lot about the sort of like the, the godfathers of acting and stuff like that and the method? Very, very hard. Yeah, not to just upset your listeners but the most boring segment of all time, but like, Essentially, like there was this guy Stanislavski, like a Russian theorist, and that he was like one of the ones that started it, and then everyone's got their own like, kind of interpretations based off that. So it was all writing stuff about that, and I just was just talking nonsense. Like they'd, they'd be like, "In your performance as that tree, how did you get to that point?" And I was like, "Well, oh, trees have leaves." I was thinking at the time, my dad leaved me, you know, and then I got sad, and then I played that, and just pushing your way through. And after high school, so I won that like highest cheer role, which was just enough encouragement for me to be like, I'm going to do this. And then uh, the first thing I thought, I was chubby all the way through high school. And I was like, actors are not chubby. They're fit. So I just went to a gym. That was my first thing. I was like, I'm going to work at a gym and figure out how to get fit because actors are fit. So any actors out there listening, that's the first step. <laughs> Don't think about acting wrong. Get shredded. That's the key. So, yeah. Do you do it in a healthy way? Oh, were you like vomiting, vomiting? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, I'm gonna be that, so famous! You, you, you gotta work your way into that. No, I mean, I guess thankfully, like, the, uh, the male uh, image that I was trying to achieve was like, you know, being muscular and that, 
you know, otherwise I would have I would have done anything it took. Yeah, but I just yeah, I just worked at the gym, I had a front fringe and earring, it was a great look, it was awesome. Uh, probably, oh, probably, the, probably my peak, dude. You know, I need like, to see. I need oh, to dude, see I've got, that. I've got like photos from. Yeah, I wish it was longer before with that, with that epic front fringe. Um, and yeah, just working on the front desk at seventeen, and then eventually a guy came through the gym who was starting his own CrossFit place. This was in like two thousand thirteen, so this is when CrossFit was still like, if you could do twelve pull ups in a row, you went to the games. You know what I mean? Like it was, <laughs> the bar was pretty low. Um, and he came in and he was just fucking jacked and he was like kind of proportional as well. Like he looked athletic, but he didn't look like a bodybuilder in the sense of like, oh, this looks like weird. Um, then I just said, what are you doing? How are you doing? What's going on? He's like, I'm doing CrossFit, come try. And then that kind of just, that just started that whole journey. But before that, I did like almost no fitness, nothing. I just was, I gave the best hugs and high school girls used to say, you know what I mean? I was not, I was not heavily desired at all. We played like strengths. We do, and I still, you know, to this day, pretty mean hug. <laughs> Retain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, just went on that and just started uh, training. And I think, again, in retrospect, I became so obsessed with CrossFit early on and like competing because it just became the first thing in my life that I was like, you know, I, I was not talented at anything up until that point, and that was no exception. But like, if I worked hard. It was just the first thing I'd done that lended itself to people who just worked hard and consistently over a long period of time. Whereas like I saw like saw in football, like people would just be naturally good with the ball, like naturally good at kicking or like basketball, they'd be tall or whatever. And I'm like, it's done. But this was something that like across the board, because there's gymnastics, there's weightlifting, there's all these different aspects to it, you had to kind of just be consistent. And people who were talented kind of came and went. And then just a little angry tubby kid that hung around ended up getting better at it. I was like, this is a cool sport. So I did that for way too long. I was actually talking to my friend Kieran who we trained with at mm. CrossFit Academy as well. He came from CrossFit at the same time and I was literally having coffee today and I was like, all those years wasted. Imagine if it was jiu-jitsu we were doing. Imagine how good we would be. Wasted it all. But, uh, Is jiu-jitsu the new CrossFit? I'll have to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, like, I'm never going to get that. Right 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 right. <laughs> I can picture a red dot coming to the window just now. Like, watch it, watch it. Like, um, I think for me, it's like, it's the new, it's just like, for me, it's, it, 18 months of jujitsu has done more for my self esteem than anything else I've done, you know? And that's not because now I can just punch on people in the street. There's actually no striking in jujitsu if you didn't know that. Um, but it's more just, yeah, I guess the putting yourself in really tough situations of like, you know, um, daily getting out of kind of life and it feels like life and death at times even though it's not it just does something for your self-esteem it just builds it in this certain way that you can't cheat you know martial arts i think as a whole does that so it definitely has become something in my life that i have no aspirations to become a professional athlete in jiu-jitsu or even mixed martial arts but it is something that now if i don't do if i don't train semi-regularly i can just feel my like my self-esteem and my happiness at this like this low bar i just can't get it above i'm like ah oh, it's just not the same I need to be choked by my friends to be good. <laughs> you know, which is the sad reality. Oh, it's been a while since they've always wrapped their legs around my head. Man, <laughs> everyone that does it, everyone that does it just like talks so highly of it. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm at the fucking precipice of it. You seem like a pretty obsessive guy though. Like maybe it's, well, maybe it, you're that's scared of it. You're yeah, like, I don't know if I can obsess in. down that road. Yeah, it would be. I think it can be, man, because it like, it is like most things that become addicting just so much micro progress, mm. you know, there's just so many ways to progress constantly. Even black belts who are good are still always learning. The game is always evolving. Everyone's always getting better. Everyone's always new, uh, doing something new. And uh, yeah, you just become so addicted to the problem solving aspect of it, I think. And again, just getting choked by, choked by the lads. It's addicting, man. It really is. It took, it took something like drastic to actually get me to go there. Cause I spent, I would have spent three to five years, you know, around people like Jack Beckers and Stephanie Del Pizzo's and even Rod to a degree and used to like muck around. All of those like really strong jiu-jitsu people and it still wasn't enough to kind of get them to go. Yeah. It took like something like drastic to make me finally go, oh fuck, like I need something in my life that is going to challenge me. It's going to like push me into a place that's uncomfortable because I need it. I don't know why I... I I kind of know why I needed it, but it, there's something almost primordial in your body for sure that pushes you 
and it needs to occur for you to be able to get over that hump. And because it's so difficult, and when you go in as a newbie, day one, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. And there's very few things on this planet where you can go in and go in with a guy who's got 13 years experience and you're on day one and just have to kind of work it out. Yeah, 100%. It's so rare. And it's just so hard to even, like, even, cons- I mean, I, I didn't start in fundamentals beginners classes because I was fortunate enough that, like, Rod had just sort of opened the gym. So I was just training in the advanced classes with those guys, figuring it out as I went. So it was just exactly what you're saying. But uh, even to explain to someone in one session, like if a friend's coming down, like you can never convince people to get into jiu-jitsu. They have to have, kind of have that natural curiosity because uh, it's just, it's almost a brain fuck even to explain what is happening. Cause you, and like even now, I don't, like, I don't know. Like I brought my partner down, she's a CrossFit athlete, she's just qualified for her first regionals. Shout out to you, my darling. Well, Shout out to you. Um, jiu-jitsu is better though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she, she came down and I remember we were doing these drills and this was like me like a month or two in and we were doing this you know whatever drill it was like passing a guard or here and then she would do the drill and she'd be like now what and I'm like that's what we're all here to learn you know like, she's like what do I do from here I'm like I don't know that that's why I've come as well you know and she'd just be in position she's like I don't know what to do Blake getting frustrated I'm like no one does Rod's figure Rod's got a few tools but the rest of us are trying to figure it out as well uh, so yeah, it can, you, you have to have that natural curiosity. Uh, it's interesting to me that you said like, you know, you don't know, like I know definitely what it is for me. Um, and you said, you, you know, as well. And I think it'd be so difficult for you to go as well, because I think if you're pursuing something with your life that is more creative and, and artistic, where you have that side of yourself, so often the arts can, can and can't be a meritocracy. You know, you see variables that are out of your control. You see people sometimes pop for the, for reasons that are, out of their control and stuff like that. With jujitsu, it is the ultimate meritocracy. With martial arts, it is the ultimate meritocracy. There's very little politics. It's like, you get on the mat, if you do the right things, you win. You do the wrong things, you lose. Yeah. And it just, I think there's something within human beings that you need that. You need that certainty, that, 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 that place that is sacred where there's no politics, it's 100% accountability. You do the right things, you win. You don't go to lock up an armbar and someone says, stop, we need some more representation. Tag <laughs> someone out, they'll finish the armbar. You're like, what? <laughs> but I got all the way here. It's like, we need to represent. Like, come on now. I think it's, it's interesting that like the people, even, even though everyone's uh, in, in, those, in those processes, it's all iterative. Like, it's like, you need to learn this and then you learn that. You know, as you said, work hard, get ahead. Yeah. When we look to like um, professional MMA fighters, the, as a crowd, people are always looking to the outlier though. Like no one cares about the, the guy that works hard. You guys probably do. About the guy that like works hard and he's like the proper workhorse. Everyone's like, you know, at a sudden you're striking is like otherworldly and like uncommon. And the, you see like um, what has met Chimaev now. And they're like, it's just a freak. Yeah. But they're all doing these kind of really flashy things. And the crowd is always like, yeah, we want that. Yeah, the, the entertainment side of things with mixed martial arts is, is um, yeah, it's just it's just part of it, and it's part of why I love the sport as well. Like I have a I have a reverence for the style versus style, the hard work, the ability, especially when you start to like even. And in no way am I saying I, I've touched on the levels that I know what it takes. But that's one thing about jiu too. You have to be humble, otherwise you're a fuckhead. You're an idiot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. always go to the man. Like I heard the podcast, man. Yeah. He spoke really well on it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how do you really good to it? Really good. Let's let's turn it on. Yeah. Just whispering in here. Yeah. yeah. How can he now? How can he? Oh, he's just saying. Sorry. Um, but like when you when you actually do like even some simple wrestling drills, and you're just so fucking exhausted immediately. You're like oh, like when you watch someone wrestle for five rounds in a fight, then you're like that guy's amazing. You know, you can just feel the you yeah, can you feel your heart rate spike. Right? You're like this is just it's wild how he's doing this. Um, so there is that side of things, but. Yeah, the entertainment side of things, the shit talk, the selling of fight, you know, um, that side of things is exciting. Like, I still love, there's still someone like a Piotr Jan, you know, who's fighting obviously as well. And like, he's Russian, he barely fucking talks. He just doesn't, he just like stares at, you know, Al Jermaine Sterling's wearing a helmet and you're like, oh, you, you know, you cheater, all this stuff. And I still want to watch Piotr Jan, even though he's not shit talking at all. He's just like, I'm going to kill him. Yeah, yeah, I'm going probably. to kick his head off and kill him. I'm like, I can't believe him. That's pretty terrifying. So... It is such a complex thing. I was actually saying this to my partner, Georgia. Again, I was shitting on CrossFit. 
uh, which I probably, in hindsight now, I'm realising I should tone when it down. When you conquered something and moved on. Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, once I completed it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. CrossFit completed it, mate. Oh, um, hundred percent yeah. trophy completion. Um, <laughs> you just took the queen. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. And uh, I think I was talking to her about like CrossFit, and I said CrossFit needs more shit talk. Like the world champs at CrossFit, amazing athletes, incredibly boring, very humble, like you know, community leaders and like, good job. They like, other, they, they finish the workouts and then they encourage their competitors. I want like the world champ, Tia Claire Toomey, who's actually Australian as well. She's like the goat at the moment. Um, well, she's the goat. I want her to come out in a cape, just talking shit, being like, you sluts could never hold a candle to me. That would be wild. If she came out like that, like fireworks, like just snatches 80 kilos. I'd just be like, I'm back in. CrossFit is back That's for it. me. CrossFit's on fly fast now. Yeah, it would be wild. Imagine like shit talk with like fitness. It would be wild. I don't know. I, I, that's, it might just listening. You see that clip of the dude um, in the gym. It's in gym in Sydney. And there's just some dude doing like <laughs> incline dumbbells by himself. And this put the video, there's only, it looks like a 24 hour gym. There's only one other guy in the gym and he just fucking strolls over and then does the fakest fall I've ever seen and just bangs like a 20 kilo. Drop his weight on his head. fucking head. It was a prison boy. Yeah, he got put in, he put in jail. They had some beef or something, they were like gym friends posting, uh, like tagging each other in posts and shit. Something must have gone down. Someone maybe protein fart, I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's a sin. You know? Yeah. Crop dusted the dumbbell area. Yeah. And he's walked over with a 20 kilo plate and done this. <laughs> <laughs> Laurel and Hardy spec and dumped it on his head. Cracked his fucking skull and shit. He's gone to jail for like fucking four years or so. Five yeah, years. and then he comes back and it's weird in the video because he's like, he falls over as if he's hurt his ankle while he's done it. And then he gets up and he's like, oh, are you okay, man? And the other guy's like, you just fucking bashed my head into the way. Like, oh, he straight up knows immediately. Yeah, they, they, it's so strange. And then when they showed the video in court, the dude just changed his, his um, plea. He was like, yeah, did it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, he sees the video, though. And that's, uh, that's a guilty one. Right that, that is quite compelling. <laughs> uh, the, the Benny Hill theme. <laughs> That's wild. No, I've got, to, I've got to go watch that. I mean, that just goes to show good acting can get you anywhere. Bad acting, it's going to put you in jail. That's the one like, good thing about CrossFit though is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm in, I'm in, let's go. <laughs> I do like the team aspect though. Like, it's, yeah. it's not the gym where it's like, in my head, dudes and chicks go pump iron by themselves with their fucking way oversized headphones on in fucking skins. And uh, and post pictures on the Instagram. Yeah. At least these guys are in there like gassing each other up, and there is a real team vibe. Yeah. Same with like the the gym that we're at. You know, you can really sense there's a camaraderie there. For sure. CrossFit definitely has that. It has absolutely. It's like it has that very tribal appealing side of things to it. And like anything, if you're suffering together, especially it's something you know that's physically, you're physically suffering together. It builds that camaraderie. And I have to say. Like, I was never very good at CrossFit. I don't know why I'm disclaiming that. People are like, I'm gonna Google this guy. No, <laughs> terrible. Uh, I, competed, I competed for a while, but like I have friends and my partner as well. It's like, when you do anything at the high level, it is, it's crazy hard. Like, you know, George is going to um, regionals at the moment. She just squat cleaned 100 kilos. She's a 61 kilo female. Georgia is a fucking beast. I obviously came across her because I met her through you. Yeah. And I follow her Instagram now and I'm like, what the fuck? Imagine coming home to that every day. I know. You know what I mean? And you like take your shirt off, you had like a croissant that day, and then she's just like, how are you? And just nice. She's just like, you look great. I'm like, ugh. Just showering in a fucking so wedding. disgusting. <laughs> I got a rash guard again to go in my own pool. I'm like, I'm like take that off. I'm like, no. You take it, you're fine. Yeah, there's, there's some trauma there. You definitely, you definitely yeah. wore some rashes and support. I have such an unrealistic fucking, I mean, this is the bubble that I'm in, you know what I mean? Like, I come home to that and that's, that's what I'm doing and no wonder I've got fucking eating disorders and shit. <laughs> like, this last, um, this last role that I just got back from this, in this TV show, like, I had to, like, the majority of the episode, like, my guy was shirtless. And I think, like, I'm always super conscious and worried about being indulgent and vain because, like, I think when you see it reflected back, you're like, oh, fucking gross. But then you definitely know you have parts of that. You're just trying to keep it in check. And uh, it kind of was part of the, I mean, it was part of the character that he had a good body. 
Like it was part of like it was in the script. Like you're like the d- the kind of douchey ex boyfriend. Is that, I read the I read the. That's uh, what I've been cast as traditionally. Yeah. Like the last few times, I, my, the, the role before that, I was a white supremacist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to throw a dream role out there, but it was a fun <laughs> role to play. <laughs> like I didn't agree with his sentiments, but to play an asshole was fun because I got to just you know. When someone cuts you off in traffic, I just got to let that side of myself out all, all, oh, all day long, you know? I'm um, a method actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Blake, we're not even rolling. I just, you know. How does method acting work in court? Oh, yeah, it's true, actually. I, I was worried about that because there was a point on, on Mystery Road, that was the show, um, where it was a dream in the sense that, like, the, the production was so professional. There was a lot of money involved as well. Like, so you, had, you weren't wanting for anything. And the director, Dylan Rivers... Uh, it was just a ball. I think he's gonna be, he's, like, I'm confident he's gonna be the next big Australian director in Hollywood. He's on his way. So he's the son of Warwick Thornton, who's a really acclaimed um, Australian director as well. And this was sort of his first thing. This is his, like, making a mark moment um, in this series. And for me, it was like a big moment in my career. So it was cool to have that, that same energy reflected back. But he, like a, good, a lot of good directors do, he gave a lot of ownership over the characters. He's like, what do you think? Like, that's why I've hired you, which is what they're just, that's the fun side yeah. of it, you know, rather than just getting a job, it's more about you get to actually add your instincts and your point of views and your ideas, and maybe not all of them will make it in, but that's what you're, you're collaborating on. And uh, it was such a weird moment because there was like, my guy at some point has like racial slurs to other characters, and it was like a dated racial slur, I didn't kind of get it because it's based in the 90s, this show. And I kind of voiced it with him. I was like, hey, this is a pretty, um, this, this is like a pretty dated racial slur. Like, and he's like, yeah, he's like, oh man, like, feel free to just improv some other racial slurs if you want. And I was like, uh, okay. Like, <laughs> it's like you're, you're gonna have to write them. <laughs> <laughs> Does the other actor know? Cause like, they, they just see me come out and start improving racial slurs. And you don't want to be too good at it. No shit. Yeah. Like, Where's that coming up right. with this? I've got like, a, like, a, like a, a crimpled notepad that I've just been researching on. Yeah, it was wild, so. But other than that, like you're just you're getting to add ideas, getting to. Um, are you, are you like, to, like apologize? Like, because it would be weird, right? Because your racial slurs are obviously at minorities in the show. And you're yeah. Acting with them. Do you have to have a conversation before, or do you? Do you it's it, interesting. Or are you? Is it awkward afterwards? Because obviously, acting is the craft. You need to stick, stay true to that. Like, think about Django Unchained, and yes, I've, I've heard all the cast and. Obviously, Tarantino like really openly speak against the criticism of, of that. Like it's accurate for a slave movie. Yeah, he was like, he said it's a. Uh, he goes, if anything, it's not hard enough for what the time was, and that's what we're trying to portray here. We're not trying to portray like a current version of a historical story. We're trying to portray a true historical story. Yeah, which is exactly what's happening with with art as a whole, in my opinion. Well, film and TV primarily is it's like we're in this this period, you know, over the last 10 years where we've had that really, like, the woke culture has kind of washed its way through the industry, um, which has led to, again, more representation and a lot, lot more stories coming through, which is good, but what it has done is it's led to this very apologetic kind of wash over all films and TV shows and just content that's coming through, and good, specific art that makes an impact is very rarely apologetic. It has to be specific, you know, like, it's kind of why we haven't seen a fucking good comedy movie in the last 10 years. Because how do you how do you make a great comedy movie while being inc- like uh, trying to offend no one? It's just insane. Like, there's just no good comedies uh, out of the last ten years. But um, as far as the conversation goes, I I don't think we had a conversation, which is interesting because it was a drama. There was that. There must have been some communication. You know, like you definitely. I always make a point to meet the actor in the scene beforehand and just like introduce myself and just like have a chat to him just to kind of break the ice. I don't want the first time they see me and meet me to be in character, you know, yeah. with my shaved head and my swastikas all over me, just walking up and just calling them racial slurs that aren't even in the script. Like, I don't know, I don't know. Was, it's just hard was to that get your first image. mate sort of major role? Yeah, so I did a film um, earlier last year that I believe I'm allowed to say, I, I believe it's going to Netflix. Um, but that was based in Perth. It had like, Eliza Taylor from The 100 came over and stuff. She's originally Australian. And that was really my first professional role of substance. I was playing the, the villain in that as well. And, uh, but Mystery Bro definitely was my biggest opportunity thus far, uh, playing a villain yet again. And then this last show that I just finished uh, was, like, again, sort of a bit part, but I was not a villain. I was a modern, fabulous gay man who was invited into an older couple's 
relationship. So, how'd that go? Bit of a far cry from the previous <laughs> role. Uh, yeah, it was good, it was good. I didn't, um, again, I, I won't specify what the production was. The, the production itself was really professional. Everyone involved was, was awesome. They were, yeah, professional. The cast were very, very talented. Um, but I didn't enjoy the experience overly just because of talking about that collaborative aspect of what we're talking about. Uh, I didn't get to express much freedom or collaborate or add any ideas. It was very like paint by numbers. Like, how about you just say it how we want you to say it? Yeah, right. And you put your hand where we say to put the hand. Like, it's not about you feeling free. And people listening might, might think, well, that's an actor's job, isn't it? To just say the lines, don't change them, and just, just do the job. It, it can be, for sure. But uh, I think, without, without trying to defend myself too much, it's, like I'm, it's not about changing the, the words. It's about elevating it to a point where like, it, it sounds like a human is talking. Mm. It's making it conversational. That's kind of the actor's, a screen actor's job, in my opinion. You've got words on a page, and you've got to make it sound like it's a real conversation that's happening. So... There were moments where I felt that I wasn't allowed to do that, and they were just there was sort of egos involved, and they were like, "Just say what we we've, we've written," and I was like, "That's but that's not how people talk." Mm. How would you feel being the writer though in that situation? In that this actor comes in, changes what I've written, and I am a fucking playwright. I write this for a living, and he has the audacity to come along and improvise over the top. Yeah. You know, there is. There is two egos at battle there. Well, there's so many egos when it, when it comes down to it, because the majority of the time the writer's done by the time you get into production in the sense of like, like you don't have a ton of writer directors, right? So you have the yeah. directors trying to take a script and the writer, you know, remember Californication? Mm. Hank was like, there, there was that movie and he was like, he hated it, so he'd written it, but the other guy directed it. And he's like, you've taken my book and made it into a fucking romantic comedy. Yeah, yeah, changing the vision. But again, you are 100% right. There is two egos involved. But I'll give you an example so, so you can be a bit more specific with it. One of the lines, one of the situations in the episode was that uh, I come into the house and these other guys are kind of nervous and I'm my character is very comfortable within himself. And he's like, yeah, we're going to have the first one. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be awesome. And they're making me a drink and uh, they're kind of nervous. And they, one, of the, one of the guys says to me, um, would you like a squeeze of lemon or lime? And I say back, I'll have a squeeze of both of you, don't mind. So it's sort of this cheeky, hey, you know, we're going to have a oh, squeeze of both of you, please, boys. And it was it's just like a candle after. Yeah, yeah, roll that, yeah, press the button. <laughs> um, so it was that, and so we got to set, and we, we go to shoot, exactly as it was. Would you like to squeeze lemon or lime? I'll have a squeeze of both of you, don't mind. Cut, script supervisor comes over, and this is sort of where it comes into the ego sort of thing. Like, there is a job which is a script supervisor who I imagine has to justify their paycheck and their whole job is to literally look at the script and make sure people are sort of like not going on tangents. She came over, lovely lady, and said, I just want to run through this line with you, Blake. Your line is squeeze of lemon or lime. Uh, squeeze of both if you don't mind. And I said, yeah, that's, that's what I said. So that's, that's what I said. And she's like, no, no, you said something different. I'm like, fuck, I'm certain I said, I'll have a squeeze of both if you don't mind. She goes, yeah, what are you, like, what's that? What are you saying? I was, and, I'll have a squeeze of both. She's like, yeah, it's not I'll have a squeeze of both. It's squeeze of both if you don't mind. She wouldn't let, she, they didn't want me to add I'll have. And I was like, ah, uh, can I ask why? And they, and she fed me this, this thing, which actually got like an insult. And they sometimes do this in the industry. They're like, you see, your character, he's a man of very few words. Oh and I, I was like, he's not real. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing him, you know? Yeah. But, um, so it just was... Again, it wasn't changing the intention. It wasn't as if the like, squeeze lemon alarm, and I'm like, no, neither. <laughs> you know, it I was just a I'm no longer homosexual. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I'm a white supremacist, and they're like, whoa! <laughs> Swazi comes out. It's a callback. <laughs> oh man, improv <laughs> racial slur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, like that was the extent of it. Like I couldn't even add "I'll have" to a line, which is, and what I said to her was like. I'm, I'm not trying to change the line. That's just how people talk. Mm. Someone said, would you like a squeeze of lemon or lime? I'd say, I'll have a squeeze of both if you don't mind. I wouldn't say, squeeze of both if you don't mind. That, now it's weird. Yeah. Now it's cheesy. Now it's like, you know. So that's how micromanaging it was on set. And that's, from what I understand, that's rare. And to be a professional, I was like, yeah, of course. Absolutely. Whatever you want. It's your show. I'll do it. I'll you know, shut my mouth. And I uh, got on with it. But unfortunately, just for me, you've sucked all the joy out of the experience. Because mm. now I'm just literally... 
I'm pretty, machine. Ba- I'm pretty based. I can yeah, just stand here and say cool, how you yeah. want. Anyone can do this. I don't really want to do anything that anyone could do. That's why I try to do something hard. <laughs> you know, like I wanted to do a job that where who you uniquely are gets to gets you get to add that add that flavor. So, but I mean, look, it was a paycheck, and it's a privilege to be at the point where you're just getting some jobs that you're getting paid for, and it's another credit, and you're moving up. You know, sometimes we look at good actors I IMDb's and you see some just trash early in their career. You're like, oh wow, I'm at that point. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully it doesn't stay there, but it stay there forever. I suppose it'd be interesting because you are, you know, like you're a paid actor, you're a professional actor. Mm. And that's a milestone to hit where you're not trying to make it in a sense you are you're you're a paid actor, so you have a job and it's bringing in money so you can live. But you're a creative person and you've got into acting to be an actor. So it's like I can't get comfortable here because that's not going to be a fulfilling journey. Yeah, absolutely. You, you're like, I want to really actually express myself and make believable characters and almost feel, do you have to feel like you have to sort of believe in yourself? I'm fascinated by acting and writing. Yeah. Uh, again, I can only speak to, there's so many, like, there's so many, uh, I guess, ways to do it and it's also trying to arrive, hopefully, at the same destination, which is, I mean, when I'm talking about screen acting here specifically, there's a great acting teacher who operates out of Sydney, his name is Les Chantry, and he once said, and I, I, I fully agree with it, you, the screen actor's job is simple, is to have a conversation on camera. Like, that is it. It is like, you know, but are you... Actors. Yeah. We're actors. Oh, yes! Ah, yes! yes! I was like, wait, what? Yeah. Are you quoting something? That was the whole thing. I am DBing 20 episodes <laughs> and doing it all. It's a long-running series. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it was like, have a conversation on camera with, you know, someone else's written words. And if you not turn, if you're not make, if it doesn't look like a conversation on camera and he was specifically talking about auditioning, you haven't done your job. Are you having a conversation in a different accent? Are you having a conversation in a different emotional circumstance? Like what's going on? Ultimately though, get it back to looking like a conversation as that person. If it doesn't look like a conversation because your accent's bad, then you haven't done the job. Like, but it's very simple, the concept. So, um... I mean, as far as like you ask, do you have to believe your characters and stuff like that? My, I'm of the opinion, and a lot of actors aren't, that like you can only ever, um, you can only ever bring yourself to the character. You know what I'm saying? So there's not like you can never actually fully be someone else, you, and and you're the only person that you've lived as, and you're you've only had experiences through your own life. You can't. You can imagine as much as you can, but ultimately, by imagining a, a circumstance, you're imagining it as yourself. Yeah, true. You're not like, what if I was Abe Lincoln? You're like, yeah, but if you were Abe Lincoln, mm. there's never a point where you arrive and you're like, I'm Abe Lincoln. You know, like, <laughs> I think that's a mental illness. <laughs> yeah, if you're like, no, I'm Abe, it's me, I've made it. And even, you know, method actors like Daniel Day Lewis or something like that, like, they may sit in the character, but I think what, what they're really doing specifically is they're sitting in a point of view for a long period of time. They're sitting in a point of view, so they don't just like try and rid themselves of it and then go away and then have to come back to this very specific point of view that they had to get to. That's not what they have in usual life. So ultimately it's a very overly complicated way of saying, I just try and find within a character um, a point of view that I as a human being not necessarily agree with, but I can I can understand. And mm-hmm. I think that's why it's so important as an actor to just, the job really is, about understanding who you are as a person, good, bad, ugly, all that stuff, mm. and being honest with it, and being honest with how you would be. And I think to do that, you, you can't be delusional, you have to be empathetic, and you have to just be curious, and you can't, you have to let go of this idea of wanting to look good. I can't tell you how many actors I saw in drama school, you know, doing a scene on stage where they're like, their kid's dead, and they're still trying to look good. Yeah. You're like, you know what I mean? They're like, oh, bother, <laughs> my child is dead, and I'm like, that would be a very ugly moment, you know? And so I guess, yeah, ultimately I, I, I'm of the belief where it's like, you don't have to agree with what your character, um, how, how, how they view the world, but you have to understand the human element to it. Uh, one example I always use is that I have a friend who will remain nameless. I had to, I had to play this character, oh, well, you know the character. I had to play a character who was legitimately racist. And I, for all intents and purposes, not just for the listeners, am not racist. I just don't care about things that people can't help. Like if it's their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, I don't care. I, act, I, don't, I don't give you brownie points for it, but I also don't judge you on it. So, but I had to get in this mindset of someone that like legitimately was racist or prejudiced towards people. And this particular mate of mine was, was, was a really good guy in all areas of life. Like I, I loved him in every area, but like he had expressed there was a particular race of people that he genuinely thought were like not 
the same as everyone else. And it was so strange to me because this guy was such a, a great dude in every other area. But he kind of had this firm belief that he was like, no, nah, man, but these people are like, they're fucking gross. And it's so baffling. But anyways, I kind of, I, 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 I caught up with him and I said, like, I just want to talk to you about this thing, man. And if you're, if you're okay with it, like, you're a great guy, pretty much as I said, but I want to understand why you feel this way about this particular group of people. And we just had beers and we chatted and then he got, he was telling this story. So he grew up in, in Balga in this really like low socioeconomic area. And his parents were, uh, they struggled with addiction and stuff like that. His dad left the family when he was like, I think maybe 12. And his mom was really struggling. He loved his mom so much. And basically we arrived at this point in this story where he, in his young mind, he didn't understand everything that was going on. There was addiction, there was all these things, but everything circled around money. Like all the things that his parents would communicate would be like, we have no money. And that was the source of his, his loved one's suffering and his suffering was money. And there would be these break-ins into the house. And he vividly remembers coming out into the lounge room when he was like 11 years old and he just saw his, his mom crying in the lounge room and like everything was gone. And he remembers just feeling this like this, this rage in, in him and it ended up being, it was always this race of people that were, that were breaking in. And it was so funny because as he was telling me this story, I saw like a click in him and he was like, oh fuck, I don't think I actually hate these people. I think I just love my mom. And I was like, fuck dude, like it blew my mind. And it was like, it's that old cliche of hate often is just this false idea of protecting something that you love. And I can't play, I hate this group of people, but I can play, I love my mom. I can understand yeah. that. So all I, that was the key to playing uh, an element of that character was that I don't have to pretend now when I'm on camera. Like if I just imagine that this person in front of me hurt my mum and you did something to my mum, I'm not acting anymore. Like I'm looking at you. I know you didn't, but for the remainder of this scene, you did. And I'm not acting anymore, dude. Like if this fucking camera wasn't here, I'd fuck you up, you know? And that's like, I can play I love my mum, but I can't play I hate something. So that was an interesting aspect of like finding a way to play a character that you don't agree with. And it's so interesting to have that conversation with someone as well in like a completely open space rather than because it's very it's obviously really easy to dismiss certain topics yes but to be able to try and understand and through that understanding also have them make some realizations for sure that's clearly the way forward yeah you know like and, and don't get me wrong like a lot of people are too far gone i'm sure the dude wasn't going to rallies and stuff but you know, <laughs> just... he didn't see me there researching my character <laughs> you know no, that's right like, you really mean this shit. Yeah. but yeah i know what you're saying yeah it's fucking interesting well, it's not, not nothing but so one question we asked um dan uh the guy we interviewed last week <clears throat> was around like identifying and chasing dreams sure so like you what, do you remember what the point was where you almost admitted to yourself or acknowledged with yourself that I'm an actor? And was it tied to an outcome? Was it tied to, oh, I got this job and I got paid for it or I'm an actor? Or did it come earlier where you like, no, I'm an actor and part of being an actor is going out to get a job and part of that is getting paid? Like, where, where did you start to identify as the thing that you wanted to be? Mm. That's crazy, man. I don't think I have. You know, like, I really don't. I think that... Oh, it's yeah, because acting is one of those weird things where, like, until you are given a job and you're being paid and... I mean, I always identified success for me as an actor is the day that I can support myself in the way that I... that I thought my complete lifestyle was completely funded by acting, then I'm an actor. Then I'm a successful actor. It's not Avengers set, but that would be nice. So I'm not at that point yet, you know, like I'm booking acting work, book, booking professional acting work, but I'm still having to, you know, work in cafes and do all these kind of compromises to get by. Uh, I've actually over the last 12 months been wrestling with this idea of separating what I do from who I am, you know, so Sam Neill actually says, I'm not an actor, I'm just, I'm a guy who acts. And I like that now, I think, because for me, and I don't want to get too meta with it. You discuss like you know you want to you want to be creatively fulfilled, right? I think the intention for pursuing anything that is uncertain and hard and creative, say like acting, say like music, say whatever. Hopefully, the idea is just to be able to do something that you enjoy. You don't want to go get a job that you don't enjoy. You want to do something that you do. But in the pursuit of becoming this idea, you can end up still doing something you don't like, even though you are an actor. 
or you, you're just not doing work that you enjoy. So I've tried to rid myself of just the idea of being an actor and just be someone who enjoys acting. And if I'm even if I'm acting, but I'm not enjoying it, it still doesn't feel great. And I think that that way you avoid a lot of the pitfalls because there is so many uh, elements to the journey of like figuring out how to make it and how to start working because there is just no path and it's just so fucking mentally weird. Like there's no course like. Just because you go study a course doesn't mean you're going to be good. Just because you get this manager doesn't mean you're going to work. And all these things, you can drive yourself mental with it. Which is why you need jiu-jitsu. Uh, I think getting rid of the idea of being an actor as, a, as appealing can avoid a lot of the traps. Which is like, just become a guy. Just become something you think will work. And you don't even like that guy. Which happens a lot. I see a lot of actors, in my opinion, just wanting to be anything and compromising and just like, putting their gender pronouns in their bio now because they think that's the thing to do and like sharing a U Ukrainian flag because they don't give a fuck about it but they're like, this is what I saw Brad Pitt do so yeah. is this the path, you so know? This is, this is what you need to do to make it. Yes, and there's no guarantee. It's so funny but people will run with that narrative because they're so desperate for certainty um, that they'll, they'll do anything. And the way that I've been able to try and lessen that and avoid that in myself is just get away from this idea of I'm an actor. I actually feel silly saying it. Like, I'm an actor. I sometimes get to act, and that's not even, I don't think it's coming from tall poppy syndrome of like Australia, I just think it's gen generally, um, I, I like to think of myself as someone who just tries to do what he enjoys doing, whether it be Jiu Jitsu, comedy, acting, all those kinds of things. And it's a justification to yourself, it's not to anyone else. It's quite interesting because when you do things like, if you are like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a musician, I'm gonna be an actor, I'm gonna be an artist in, in any form, you're, I always feel like the baseline of like making it is for everyone else. It's to justify the fact that you yes. did this and you made it. So it's like getting paid enough to support myself as a musician or as an artist or as an actor validates my choices to you. But there's the second part of that, which is like, what, what do I actually want to do from here? And what do I actually what do I actually want to become? And it's like, you put, putting that thing on it saying, I don't want to be what I do. I want to be who I am and enjoy the things that I choose to do. Yes. I did it with music and it, it, I, I had a really interesting sort of long period with it where I couldn't find that I, I found that I couldn't really relax Yeah. when I was relaxing because I was like, you should be working on music because the, that moment might come now and, and I hit that point of going, well, I'm not feeling that inspired when I am, I'll get, to, I'll get onto the piano, I'll do whatever. It doesn't really happen. You need to show up and you need to be there, but it's, a big, it's an incredibly hard thing to essentially stare at the table. table. Yeah. But I got really, really stoned one night and I was like, what if I am not a musician? Yes, oh, such a good, such a good high realization. Yeah, dude. Mine, mine's are more like I think I can feel the earth spinning. <laughs> oh God, there's demons in my head. I'm very hungry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So you thought that? But yeah, I was like, what if? Just, just conceptualize. What if you weren't? Because, and it, and it broke everything away. Because I, to me, I was like, well, you're not. You you make music and you do design and you're, a, you know, a boyfriend and a friend and a son and all of these things. And you start to realize that the only person that really sees you as the one thing and is defining your whole path through life is yourself. Yes. That first bit of justification skews everything because you're like, oh no, see, I proved that I'm this. But then you're like, oh fuck, now I need to be this. Yeah. And it's a tough, it's a tough place to exist in because you kind of put so much into that, hitting that first step that the second step is, it doesn't have a definitive point of destination. It's that what now? It's yeah. that, and that's, you know, it's kind of what I went through a little bit um, over the last 18 months was that like, I just, I've just been head down chasing this thing I thought I wanted since I was a teenager. And it's just such a unique um, pursuit in the sense that it takes so long to even be able to try the fucking thing. Like even to be able to try it once professionally, it takes, it took me fucking six years or like, you know, so, yeah, more than that, seven years, I guess. So from 18 to 25, was 24 was my first gig. And that, that was only such a little snippet. So I hadn't really tried it. I just kind of walked on and said some 
said some shit and left. I'm like, that's pretty cool. I'll do some more of that. But you spend so long in pursuit of this thing that I had that what now moment. Um, and internally, I realized not long ago that I had achieved every goal that young, insecure tub of me set out to do. Internally, not probably not in the eyes of others, but uh, internally, I was like, all right, you're going to become fit and healthy and you're going to change your image in other people's eyes. You know, because again, and I do think it's a per thing generally, like to this, this want to, as a creative, get people off your back mm -hmm. and be like, I know I'm not at uni, I know I don't have a trade, but I will, you will see that it has value. Um, yeah, so like I, I started working and, and, I, and I got these, these roles and, and they were fucking fun roles to play and then I started doing comedy and started doing well as a beginner very early on and getting you know, good crowd reactions, all those types of things. And I kind of just, I got everything that I set out that young, weird, chubby me when girls wouldn't notice him in his granny flat at the back listening to heavy metal. I, like, if he could see it now, he'd be like, we did it! Yeah. You know, <laughs> and it didn't feel any different. Mm. You know, I just, and then what I was left with that question, and I think it's kind of what you're saying, is it's like, holy fuck, do I actually enjoy any of these things, or did I only enjoy the idea of them, and what I thought it would give me? And that's what we spoke about before, about success not being tied to the outcome Yes, anymore. It's about process. God, it's so fucking, they, 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 were, they were onto something with all these cliches. I know, right? It would have been so much easier if you could just tie it to the outcome. Oh my god, dude. I mean, imagine how happy The Rock would be. Well, yeah. <laughs> You know exactly how far you've got to go because there's the finish line right? and I know how much I need to do or what I need to achieve to get there and then sure. once I'm there then I can cross it off but it's not doing You ever been to the Greyhounds and there's the... Oh the rabbit constantly chasing Yeah they won't, dogs won't run unless they have something that they can't catch Yeah And that's the way that I see a lot of kind of creative pursuits or just life pursuits in general It's like if that rabbit was sitting there and they opened the gates, the dogs just ran all the rabbit. Yeah, yeah. The dogs would just sit around, you know, sniffing each other's butts, but you need to keep that thing moving. It needs to constantly be slightly out of your reach to, to keep you going. I think that's like the human consciousness. It requires that. Yeah, and you just gotta hope that, yeah, like you said, you just gotta hope that you enjoyed the process. Because when you get to set, and you've been working in cafes and you're 26 and everyone's checking in and being like, how's acting going? I just bought a house. Uh -huh. You know, I'm having children. How are you doing? And I'm just like, yeah, it's good. And then you get there and you're like, I, I finally got the thing. I finally get to do it. I'll have a squeeze. And they're like, don't say I'll have it. Like, oh, none of it was worth it. I should have been an accountant. Fuck, I knew it. You know? so, yeah. it's great. That's why I love these conversations because we get two completely different, di different points of view on, on a creative pursuit like that, that I touched on before, the reason he wanted to identify as a photographer was because that was his way of overcoming the imposter syndrome that he had. Everyone was saying, well, no, you, you're not a photographer. And he said, well, no, I am because when I take a photo, it doesn't mean I have to be published or it doesn't mean I have to be published in this magazine or be on this TV show. I am this. and that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. But your point is equally as valid in that it doesn't fucking matter what you identify as. Yeah. As long as it ticks your box, you know? It's but your it, yeah, it's your relationship with that. Mm. Having that having that stable base is something that like I'm so grateful for. I think with my my current my why did I say current? She's gonna hate this podcast. She's like, you're shut on cross, but you call me your current, it's like there's a future. <laughs> with my forever girl, uh, <laughs> Georgia. Um I think I, I, I had a realization not too long ago as well that like it's very easy to want to be with someone when you're feeling low and you're feeling shit and you want a teammate and you want to cuddle and you want to feel good and you're like, oh, no, I'm not feeling great. Uh, and that's kind of normal, but there have been a lot of times where I've come home late from like a comedy night and like I crushed and I feel like a god and I'm just thinking, take your pants off, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> My late time. She took me that. <laughs> I snatched a hundred! <laughs> Take your pants off like yesterday! Make me laugh! I managed to play it in the fridge! <laughs> Fuck you! I come, I come home and like, she's in bed, asleep, snoring, you know, in my, in my shirt, doing, you know, sleep farts, and <laughs> I feel on top of the world, and I still look at this girl, and I'm like, Fuck, I love this chick, you know, like, and I've got, a, I've got an awesome base. And equally, I've come home from bombing, where I'm like, I just, dad was right. I should have got gone to uni. What am I, but this is awful. And come home to the same, 
sleep button, beautiful misses, <laughs> and I'm just like, this is the truth, you know, this is my stable base. And it's a very nice feeling to realize that the, the ego, especially the male ego, when we're doing good, that sort of nomadic gene kicks in where we're like, spread the seed, <laughs> become a warrior, you can travel, you're a king. Don't be shackled, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. That Genghis Khan comes in your mind, you're like, yeah, yeah, that's, you back from that's, the world. yeah, that's the goal, hey, spread this perfect sea, what are you doing? And to be on a high and still feel really happy and stable and in love, um, I think it's, that's a really nice, a really, really nice base to have. And it's kind of what's important, this last two years, although really fucking shitty, uh, and I messaged you, Scott, as well, about like, you know, you saying you you wanted to, you feel like you're at the point again where you need to get out of Perth and you need to, um, you know, go out there and experience as you have done in the past. Like Perth is, I think for some of us, amazing when it's a port, you know, to like refuel and recharge and all that, all, the, all those things. But get chlamydia. Get chlamydia. <laughs> get chlamydia. <laughs> I'm recharged with the chlamydia <laughs> and I'm ready to spread it to the East Coast and the world. Uh, yeah, so like, I had that moment like, just very, very recently as well. I, when I went to Melbourne and Sydney, it was my first time out of WA in two years. And I was living in Sydney uh, when COVID hit and I came back to Perth and I just, it kind of opened my eyes again. I'm like, oh fuck, that's right. The fucking world's huge. And this was only Sydney and Melbourne. You know, so- still world class cities, it's crazy. Yeah, and I was just, and like what I noticed was, man, and I'm not blaming Perth, I'm blaming me. But this city and the pace of it can make me feel shit about myself. Like, if you don't see yourself reflected back at all, like, no one that I know uh, really is doing the exact same things that I'm trying to do. Like, I know people who are actors, but I also, but they're on a different path and etc. When you don't see yourself reflected back around you, you start to, it starts to wear on you, like, in your subconscious. And when I was in Sydney and Melbourne, like, I would see, you think it would it would make you feel worse. You'd be like, I thought I was a snowflake, but here I am everywhere. But it, it was comforting, you know? Like when I went to LA in 2019, I didn't realize how much I apologized for wanting to be an actor until I went to LA. And like, I went there and they were like, you an actor? And I was like, well, you know, like I, I tried, I tried to do, and they were like, yeah, of course. Like, so you should, like, you seem like a, you know, well-spoken guy. You, yeah, of course. It's, it's like being an engineer in Perth is so being an actor. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a completely perspective shifting thing. It's yes. Cool. Because you are not used to actually putting yourself out there, you almost shell up a little bit when explaining what you do. Yeah. Whereas there, they're like, oh, this, you get introduced to people as your name and then what you do. They, they almost give you like a little hype. They're like your little hype guy. Little, little pimp friends. Yeah, because you become a commodity to them as well, because LA is like that. It's like, Oh yeah, yeah, this is my friend and he does this and I have high value people around me. Oh, that's interesting. I never saw that side of it. I mean, I had, I had a really strange experience. I think from people who have spoken about LA, I had just this starry eyed, you know, I had this starry eyed experience of LA where I was only over there for like 14 days. And at this point I had zero acting credits, but my, my acting manager in Sydney is just a baller. He's a really, really good friend of mine as well, but he's really connected. And just in this period of time that I was there, he got me in the room with so many people that I just should not have been able to get in the room. Like I just had no credits, like I have no reason to meet with me. And when I went there, like every conversation, every interaction I had was just so positive. Like no one tried to touch me. I was ready for it. I was like, whatever you need, I'll take that pants <laughs> off. I know how this town works. No, I just, you know, I remember there was very- the meetings, just cracking your jaw. Like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's become a star. Yeah. Yeah. And then me too ruined everything. <laughs> my path but I remember just yeah I remember just going into these places and there was no power dynamic like there was this one um this one cast director lady I, she was just amazing she was very very powerful in, in the industry like she cast a lot of great stuff I remember I came in and she was like take your shoes off and I was like oh okay and then I sat on a couch and like she had this little old dog on the couch this little like almost like Pomeranian thing and she's like so just tell me about yourself and I obviously immediately went into like my spiel like my highlights and she just kind of was like, she sat through it politely. And she was like, that's cool. Um, so like, tell me about your family. Like, and just, and, I, and then I, I kind of was like, oh, like she doesn't want me to sort of like dance monkey dance, which can be this, unfortunately not always, but it's, it can be the Aussie industry here in film and TV. It's very, they, they love the power dynamic of like, you're here and we're here. And you, what's your party trick? It's a real story from the thing I was doing the monologue. They're like, stop, what's your party trick? Move on. <laughs> so, holy shit. Um, but yeah, there was just no power dynamic. And what I noticed in LA, was, and I know this is not everyone's experience in LA, this must have been where I went, but 
the structure of conversations was reversed. Like in Perth, what I noticed is, and in, I'd grown up my whole life here, people were always ask you, people wouldn't ask you how you are, they'll just ask you how you're doing. And like that, I always took it as just like Aussie jargon, like how are you doing? But just the very connotation of the thing would, would sort of more be based in how are you doing at life, as opposed to how are you? And all the questions, if you ran into someone that you hadn't seen in a while, if you met someone, the first things they would ask you would always be these very categorical questions of, what do you do for work? Where are you living? Are you studying? Are you seeing anybody? Okay, interesting. And like very rarely would it make it to this point of like, but how are you? Yeah. And um, what kind of happens on instincts is this verbal exchange of resumes, you know? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Here it is, just slide that across, you can read up on me just there. And in LA, what I noticed was it's sort of just, I guess, more of an American structure is they would just be like, how are you? It's almost like emotional. I was like, I'm quite well. <laughs> no one's asked me in years. You know? And then later on would come these categorical questions of like, so what do you do with yourself, man? And, 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 and uh, all that stuff. But it would create an opportunity for connection. And I just connected with people everywhere I went and uh, not physically, um, but it was cool, man. I really enjoyed that. And then when I came back to Perth, it just, it kind of went back to that, that feeling of, needing to prove myself, that defensiveness, like I'm doing good, back off, like everyone's dad, you know what I mean? It boils you slowly, man. Yeah. Like it's like, it's such a nice jacuzzi to come back to, but like you stay for too long and you're just fucking melting, you know? Yeah. I, I feel like the fucking Pied Piper with this shit I said last week, because I've had so many messages just to, to me personally, of people going, I'm feeling exactly the same way. And it's like, I think that's just a general consensus, like, Absolutely. is that not everyone knows why, but we know that we're like, we have this kind of shell put over us where it's like, oh yeah, you can go, but you can't come back. <laughs> yeah. And so everyone's like, oh, you know, we'll just kind of wait it out. And it was this kind of very strange sort of just, just isolating, just personally isolating thing. And as you, I think I said to you when we were messaging each other, being like an outlier here or doing something interesting, um, it's also something that I consider interesting. So, you know, whether it's making music, acting, pushing forward with a, with a career that isn't in the fucking mining industry, it's like... Take that, FIFO workers. I love you, Danny. <laughs> um, but, you know, like that sort of thing you can kind of be a little bit of an outlier here and think that that's, you're like, oh, you know, I feel like maybe I'm doing something different. But then you realize that like all the people that were like that just had the smarts to leave and go to a place where there was more people like that. For sure. I feel like kind of the last one of the party. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's an interesting metaphor for it. I think it just, when I came back now, Perth switched in my mindset again of being a stepping stone. I fucking, and then, and then I instantly, like as soon as I mentally made that switch, I loved Perth again. Like just temporarily, I'm like, oh fuck, if, if this is not forever, like, if this isn't my whole life, and this isn't just me, and I, you know, have a couple of kids, and that's, and like I'm done, you know, which again is it's still a fine and a great life, but mm. for me, creatively, fulfillingly wise, it, like once I've made that mental switch that it's a stepping stone and I'm gonna, you know, turn it back into a port, I'm suddenly like, fucking Perth's pretty cool though. Like I'm back to seeing all the good. It was just this idea of, Almost like, you know, you're really comfy in a room and you're happy in the room and they're like, by the way, you can never leave this room and you're like, get me the fuck out of this room! You know, it's... Oh, that John Cusack film where you go to the hotel. 14 away yeah. from that film. Shout out to John Cusack. I'm sure he's listening. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so no, I, 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 I wanted to reach out to you because I, I have felt that myself and... And yeah, like I've, 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 I've like to think I've evolved beyond the point of just perp hating for the sake of it. Mm. It just, it, I know a lot of the responsibility lies with me and this is a great place to raise a family, to, to build a life for yourself and all those types of things. But I'm also past the point of, of, of being apologetic about it. I'm not apologetic, but I'm also like, fuck perp. Yeah. I'm just like, fuck perp for me sometimes. Yeah. It's just like knowing where you fit and knowing where you don't to some degree. But yeah. the, it's funny you talking about going to LA and having those conversations. like. He had such a sort of profound impact on me. I was like, it's one five and I went there for the first time. Oh, shit. And I was like, it just made you realize it. Like for me, it made me realize two things. One was that what people were doing there wasn't that different to the things that me and my friends and people I respected were doing here. It was just on a bigger platform. For sure. And it was like, oh shit, if we were here, we'd really be 
I'm doing exactly the same thing you'd, you'd really be popping off. Um, is it economy of scale though? Like, it's it not help. Not necessarily because there's way more people there and there's still only a few people doing shit that, that, that really spoke to me. So there was obviously bigger crowds of people who could follow and stuff like that, but it was, it kind of made you feel even more in tune with things because you would just assume that there was like, there was more community. There was just, yeah, so many people yeah. doing stuff there. Like, you know, like everyone talks about how big and crazy the, um, I think the dubstep scene was in London. And they'll talk about like plastic people and clubs like that. It's a fucking tiny club we've been in. You know what I mean? Like it was like the size of bar. All of me. Yeah. There was not one female in this entire place. I'm careful, I'm still coming off this previous uh, role. Uh, what is the name of this club again? Could you that down? I had to take my shoes off to get in too. Did you really? Yeah, to check my socks for drugs. Mm. What? The socks for drugs? I feel like yeah, me, I can't, can't remember, remember. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember where the drugs actually were. <laughs> They're not this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting because it does definitely... It makes you realise that there is a bigger world out there and there's a lot of people that kind of respect the things that you're into. The, the, the thing that sh that amazed me the most was you would go out and everyone, the most common conversation you would have, people were working in entertainment. Yeah. So like I was out having a drink with Pink, the personal assistant, and various, you know, everyone was connected. Someone what's, was, what's her colour? <laughs> She's yellow. Cream. I am yellow. Um, no. <laughs> I hope so really work my way up to the high on the colour palette one day. My friend hooked up one time when we were there, he hooked up with um Eve. Do you know Eve? Remember Eve, um, the, uh, the rapper with the dog too? Yeah, her her personal assistant and she was out of town and like while they were together, this guy I know and her, they had to go and feed her cat or feed her dog or whatever it was. And he's like, yeah, sick. So he went there and she's like, yeah, I don't know you very well, but you've got to stay in the car. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's probably a wise move. You would have definitely been She's a damn good PA. I hope he yeah. hears this story. <laughs> she's like, I should have should fight that bitch. <laughs> she made my cat, but... But everyone, everyone there is in entertainment and everyone there is, intra is into networking because that's, you've only got to find that amount of time to sure. like, kind of make it. So going out every night was like actually beneficial that's how you were meeting people and doing yeah. things. whereas here it was like you'd go out to a social engagement and you'd speak to people and they're like i'm in mining or i'm in oil and gas or i'm in sure this and it was like i was like man i'm meeting all these really interesting people it's like oh no this is a more interesting place for what for, for what i'm into for what you're into yeah. absolutely i think yeah it's it's Ah, oh, just because you, you touched on networking and stuff like that like you know there is a way to play the game in every industry and i i am Oh, I'm just so bad at playing the game. I just, I don't want to do it. You know, my manager, I remember like, I have US management as well. And I'd met with a few US managers when I was in LA. And I met with uh, Chris Burbage, who's like Chris Hemsworth's manager, and, like a bunch of uh, other big actors in LA. And we had this fucking awesome chat. And I've met with him twice, actually. He's a great guy, he's from Texas. And like, again, there was no power to that. He was just chatting his people. And like, it was a conversation like this, you know. Uh, I didn't tell him the story about my racist friend, but we... <laughs> We, we, we you know, sort of just talk, talking as people and ultimately at the end of it, he was just like, you know, I get your thing, man. I, I like him as a person. Um, I'm just going to be straight up with you, dude. Like, I've got, I've got your thing on my books and like, if, if I sign you, you're going to be sitting there for a while. Like, because I'm going to prioritize Chris, you know, and it was just so refreshing. It was so honest. And he's like, I think you're too good to like sign with me now. Like, because you're going to sit here, go sign with someone who's going to be hungry for your thing. And I just appreciate that honesty. I met with another... Uh, manager at 360 who did like another big people and like these were all great chats and they just weren't willing to kind of invest in me as a business at that point in my career which I totally got because I had no fucking credits I was a nobody like in, in LA and but at the same time I had this confidence to be like that's cool you just don't get the reward but I pop off like you just you don't get to be a passenger along the way and I do want someone who's super hungry and the point of the story is that my, my Australian manager I went to meet with my current managers via Skype and he was like look just uh, just don't mention that uh You've met with other managers and they've passed and stuff, and I was like, "Why?" He's just, he's like, "I just, you know, it's just better to just sort of be like, no, I never really, never really met." And I was just like, "I'm not lying." And I, was, and I, I, I said to him, "I was like, yeah, for sure, man, absolutely, that makes sense." And then the first thing I asked him, like, "Have you met with anyone else?" I'm like, "Yeah, I met with, I met with Chris Burby. I just rattled off all these people, 
Because again, I didn't want to start it off on this false foot of me trying to look my best. I just wanted to be real and be like, this is where I'm at. I'm not going to apologize for it. But if you don't, you guys don't want to invest at this point, when I play Fishman in Avengers 8, <laughs> you don't get a cut of that. You know, that was sort of my mindset. And, and thank goodness I did it because now I've got people who just, they get what you're about. And the social media side of things, I've always been really bad with. The podcast is really the first thing I've actually wanted to do um, and put it out there and promote it because it's not just me. Mm. I really have a problem with things being just like, look what I'm doing. It has to be like a little bit of a wink. I have to have something in there. And it's not even talk, it's just like, if this is not of service for people, why would I put the content out there? Like, I at least hope they're going to enjoy the conversation or they're going to laugh or there's going to be something in other than just check how good I'm doing. Mm. I think it will show, it, it's such an interesting thing for like an up and coming actor as well because it actually shows, like everything is a test, right? Like you're testing, so you know when you went and met with that casting agent and she was like, tell me about yourself. You're testing for, a, like she has a role or she has a, a type of category that she kind of wants to put you in. She wants sure. to see you talk about something that actually means something to you. Yeah. And then go, oh, that's that person. And we can make him work here. You know what I mean? Like, For sure. so people want to, want to see that. And when you are having one hour, two hour long form conversations with various different guests and people from different walks of life, over time, people are seeing, you know, if they're invested in the podcast or whatever it is, they're seeing actually really who you are. Authenticity, yeah. Yeah, and it, but no, you can't, on Instagram, you, you, it's very hard to not present yourself as one thing. Absolutely. Especially if that one thing starts getting some form of success, and you're like, I'm gonna drill down into that one thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. But with this, it's like, it feels like a truer form of self-representation because you can't hide after a while, like it's like, you're talking shit, you're happy, you're sad. Like I, when we started this podcast, like I was suffering from like major depression. So yeah. I was like, it's going to come out at some point. Yeah. And it's like, I like to think that I'll probably, if I did go back and listen to them, I'd be able to pick up on like general negativity in some parts of it. And then more positivity at this point. And it's like, you'd be able to see that sort of personal growth, which is the, the goal, right? For sure. Yeah. <laughs> but you are also as an actor showing insane range because you have such a fucking a, a wide spectrum of general emotion that if you're having this through our conversation that. every week yeah and it's accepting of that you know because it's like yeah you you do try and curate an image and again man like i could fucking talk to me in 10 years time and i'm still a barista i'm like i was wrong boys <laughs> it was all about playing the game authenticity was not the part <laughs> latte for jam <laughs> uh, but uh <laughs> Yeah, again, I'm just following the fun, you know, man, because that is the danger of like, not danger, but that's the scary part of a podcast is you can't hide who you are and you sort of trust that you are a good person. You're not a, you know, but I've had, you know, I'm sure you have had too. I know Josh definitely had a moment with uh, the old uh, Kelm Scott Oscars uh, conspiracy theorist the other day. I was fucking giddy about that. I was walking through Sydney with the headphones on. I was like, yeah, Josh is in a mood. Yeah, right exactly. there, dude. We got our first hater after that. Yeah, oh, I'm that's so sick, good. Dude. I'm so stoked. Dude, you came for him as well in like a in a totally anonymous like. You are anyone until someone with an anonymous profile has gone off on a verbose bitch about you on the internet. Fuck, so, I'm not there. Success. I, I, I had a, I think I sent it to you. Did I sent it to you? No, I think I sent it to you. I, I had a, well, we had oh. a scathing review from like a listener. Uh, and she's listened to every, oh, damn it, I've revealed the gender. <laughs> damn it, what the hell? It's, I don't know how she identifies actually, so I could be, I could be doing something. I put her in the purple hair brigade. Oh, oh we're getting, we're getting her narrative, but. I was so grateful on one hand that she has listened to every episode because she was kind of like, she kind of called back to certain episodes and I don't know if she listens, but boy was this review scathing. And there was truth to her criticisms, but she just did it in a very, very harsh, man hatey way. What was her, what was her, what was her? It was, it was very, very valid. I was like, I was a terrible host of a particular guest that we had. And I was just offering a lot of my opinions on things too much. And I will, I fully disagree with that. <laughs> first, <laughs> ranting. Oh, here we go. <laughs> first of all, she's from Kelm Scott, okay? First, the interview. You was... got, hang on, you got five plots and four cunts. Okay, shit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I thought the interview was great for a start. Okay. Secondly, 
it's not for you, it's for everyone. Yeah. So I appreciate your feedback, but also didn't ask for it. Fuck off. Yeah. Second, how egotistical is it of you to be like, hey, that thing that you do for free. Oh yeah. Do it better. Do it better. Yeah, cater it more to me. And please, yeah, at least consider what I would like to hear. I'm getting a boner from this criticism. Oh right now. I just want you to know. Oh my lord. Go go fucking listen to Oprah's podcast or some shit because we don't want you here. Oh god, yeah, it was the thing I I agree as well. But there were things about her criticism that I felt within myself, even before she messaged, I was like, I my tastes as a host and as a like just trying to have a conversation. There were elements that I think I want to build upon, you know, and that's something that I always, I don't agree with things that I don't like, agree with, you know, like I, someone can criticize me and I'm like, I don't agree, but there were things about it that I was like, no, I can't lift my game in that. and I would have anyway, if you hadn't roasted me privately yeah. while I'm just frothing coffee, it questioning comes, my life decisions anyway. It comes organically, Blake, I mean, how many fucking episodes have you guys done? Yeah, so I think we the, just did, we just recorded 11. Well, there you right. go, like, we're- Give we're, us a second! We are learning. I'm an IT professional, he designs band posters for a living. <laughs> sorry, that's so reductionist, but you can get that on purpose. But, like, we are figuring this out as we go. Sure. As I said to someone the other day, it's like, most of the stuff that comes out of my mouth here, I haven't even considered before it comes out of my mouth. Yes. I'm forming fully fledged ideas in my head and then just expunging them into the internet. I might not even agree with myself in four days For after sure. I've had a chance to re-listen. But it's part of the process. I have to get it out to be able to be like, oh, you know what, Josh? I don't think that we, we believe that. We, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's part of the process, and for someone to come on and be like, well, yeah, but I wish it was like this, it's really fucking... It's indulgent. It's indulgent. It is sure. indulgent. Um, but you know, they're probably just not on there. You know, it's it's very easy just to throw fucking criticism and be a part of the conversation. Oh, the man in the arena thing. speech comes to mind. You know, that, that great one from Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, it is that. For sure, and uh, imagine someone reviews this episode after that, after this talk, they're like, guys, don't agree with any of your criticism <laughs> or criticism there, here's, here's why. You're welcome to come on and face the wrath of Josh after <laughs> three shelters. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I look, I can't remember the original point, but to throw back to, you know, the story of my friend who, who he had this realisation, I think when you don't attack people, you provide an opportunity for connection to find common ground, you know, like if I'd come up to my mate and been like, hey, I know you're a piece of shit, right? And I have to play this piece of shit, so why are you a piece of shit? Give me an insight. Yeah, can we find some, you know, some can common you, ground? Can you just put some defences up? Yeah, um, get defensive yeah, for a second, dude. Can you do that so I can just absolutely not know the core of, like, what this problem is? Right, and it, what, it didn't make his his belief justified, and it actually brought about a change in him. Like, he, he realised something emotional and a truth about himself because I came at him, prepare your, prepare your amethyst crystal. I came at him with love, you know? Mm -hmm. I didn't come at him you know, in a full-blown attack and being like, I know I'm a monster and I'm calling you out, which is this period that I think everyone feels like they're on the battlefield just fighting for, for good. Like everyone, you know, on their keyboards feels like they're running into burning buildings to save babies. You kind of have to be though, because if you're not, then it's very easy to be seen as the enemy. Mm. If you're not out there, front and centre, with your fucking spear, charging, right. then you can be seen as a fucking proponent of the other side. Silence is violence, guys. I think, was, I think that's that. the idea. Like, I think the, the idea is that, but I don't live by it, and neither do you. Like, none of us do, in a sense. So it's like, you... I think that the, the honest conversations are definitely independent conversations that people are having, and the real conversations that people are having that I've been around in like actual forums where there are no microphones is people having pretty open discussions about this and being like, well, I don't, I don't feel we can really discuss this in, in public or they'd be scared yes. to, to voice your opinion. So even if this sort of radical sort of left strip is something that's kind of here to stay, I think that it opens people up to have at least deeper, meaningful conversations about these topics. Yes. And it's like, you know, maybe that's the fucking silver lining at all. Well, one thing that was a very hopeful um, element to the last job that I just did was that I had this internal realization because I have a responsibility to play in this fact that I have internalized this 
idea that I think that the world thinks I'm a villain because I'm what I was, you know, I, I'm not on social media that much, but like if the narrative, especially in the acting industry is that like, if you're a white straight guy, you are the enemy, which is not the whole narrative of what's being pushed, but they have this, you know, there is sort of generally a consensus as to where the privilege lies. And my, my mom is full, like a moldy woman. So I'm like, I know I look white, but I actually have a bit of brown in me. So you got to cut me sound slack, but I internalize this sort of narrative of like in the industry, I'm like, yeah, well, fucking, you think I'm just this privileged thing, whatever. Maybe I'm not a progressive person. Maybe I am this fucking monster because I don't agree with all this cancel culture side of things, you know, this uh, lack of accountability, et cetera, et cetera. And then I have this moment where I'm on set for my last job and I'm in a bed, in my jocks, just about to make out with two other male actors. And I have zero qualms about it. Like I'm acting, I don't, I gen, I don't care. Like, I'm like, I just, it doesn't bother me. I'm not like, oh, God is watching. I, like, I'm not a monster. Like, I, don't, I don't think of these outdated ideas. And I was sort of like, oh, yeah, I am a fucking progressive dude. I'm super progressive. I just don't subscribe to this wokey um, narrative that can get pushed on social media. And the great thing was is the people around me that were working on that set didn't either. Mm. And they were legitimately progressive people. You know, the two co-stars that I was with are both gay in their personal life. They weren't angry cancelly people, you know, they were just like, they were laughing about it, they were having a good time, like, and it kind of gave me hope that, again, I think even though in my industry there is a lot of that present, there's no doubt about it, I think the people who are always good at what they do and are operating at the highest levels, they don't subscribe to this crazy, illogical way of thinking. And I don't think anyone's worried about, like, no one's concerned about monsters being out of if you're a fucking monk, like the Harvey Weinstein thing, it's like, yeah, that's sure. great. Like that definitely should happen. Yes. But I think a lot of this, I've not seen anyone that appears to be happy, confident and comfortable within themselves going for the jugular or other people for not being as altruistic as they are. Yeah, that is the, that is the interesting thing is that it's very rarely someone who's very happy yeah and like even you know I have one of my one of my best friends in the world he's probably my best friend in the world why am I ranking I love this guy he's um, in the top 8 he's, he's yeah he's on my space now he would have been there actually from, from a long time ago uh, his his partner is from Portland Oregon and like that's kind of the birthplace of woke culture in America and I fucking love this woman she's like a sister to me but there is so much of this kind of woke uh, ideology that she's tied into her identity and she'll just kind of spout on on instinct, you know? And, and I know, because I know her as a person, that she hasn't given a second thought to that. And I'll sort of throw her back up, just like an entry level, just like, yeah, but what, like, have you thought about it from this angle? And like, it just will just be like a soul melting moment where she's like, I, what? You can't think like that, you know? And it is always interesting because I love this person. And again, I always try and comfort them with love. I'm never like, shut up, this is ridiculous. But it's interesting that just because she's from this place that is so inherently adopted this work mindset, um, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's part of her identity as well. Uh, I remember when like the vaccine, like when the, whole, when the whole mandates came out, she was like, yeah, like for me, I believe in the vaccine. I believe in it. And I was like, that's, you believe in it. Like, it's not God. <laughs> like. It, no one's arguing that it works. They're just saying that it's, they don't want to be mandated about it. And she, even at that point, didn't really understand what she was even saying. She just was attached to this idea of like, I believe in the vaccine. And I'm like, that actually makes no logical sense. Like, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but I don't believe in the vaccine. Like, that was never the issue. Like, you don't even know what the specific issue that people are taking with it. You just jump on board this ideology of like, I believe in the vaccine. That's who I am. We've so grown up watching movies where people's, right, where, where, they humanise villains and you realise that the that the um, the good guys and the bad guys both think they're the good guys. Yeah. And, you know, that that is essentially, surely we're educated enough to know that you can't just go, well, that seems like the right way to be, so I'm going to be all in on this. It's like you need to, you need to be considering all of these points of view for yourself. You know? Yeah, well, especially... For me, like, I realized when this was all going on, like, over the last few years, I've really thought a lot about it, not because I believe my opinion is so important, but I, I really played it out in my head of, like, fuck, I could spend 10 years of my life more sacrificing and getting and doing all I can to get a crack at this industry, 
get finally get to a point where I'm supporting myself and like a Facebook meme I, I commented on 10 years ago could pop up and I'm in a big production and the production fucking cancels me from it and like I lose my people don't want to work with me and all because of like largely illogical stuff mm. and that's a real fucking possibility for actors and I guess musicians but uniquely actors like if you see an actor pull from a show from like a meme you're like eh, that's, that, that happens but if you saw like an engineer that was at the head of a massive project, they cancelled him because of like a meme 10 years ago, they were like, he was building a bridge. <laughs> What's wrong with that me? Like, let him build the bridge. You know? And it's acting to me is just like, you're just pretending to be other people having conversations on camera. The fact that people hold them with such reverence is... Because it's in the it's, public eye. Yeah, and true. And if they're not, and especially because of the money behind it and the size of the organisations, if you're not seen to take a stand against it, you are the enemy. You know what is funny though is seeing the um, a bunch of stars align and circumstances align that can ruin someone's life and then also uh, the stars that can align that can make someone's life. So we've always been told stories of like someone being noticed on the street and then becoming like a, a massive Hollywood actress. And yeah, they love that story. They love that story, but now they now we have these ones of like <laughs> yeah, they were Ashton doing so Kutcher well. Was just in a bar, and then he became in that '70s show. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Like Fez from um, Euphoria was like just working in a bodega apparently. The guy with face tattoos? Nah, the the other one. I haven't seen Euphoria, Euphoria yet, but uh, it's actually <laughs> it's really <laughs> I haven't seen Euphoria. I try not to get on the hype train of things until it dies down and then I can just sort of enjoy it for the content that it is. Because I'm so unique in that way, guys. Uh, it's what makes, special, it's what makes special it, little guy. What makes me me. Black Panther sucks! <laughs> One of these contrarians. Fuck these people. Uh, that's my Kelm Scott, Josh. Contrarians. <laughs> um, and I was like, yeah, I'm not too sure. And then I was having dinner with my manager. Fuck you, my listener. It doesn't matter. You, you said it, so it's fine. He, 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 uh, we're having dinner um, and he was just like, have you seen you for it? And I trust his taste very much with acting. And I was like, no, I haven't seen you. Dude, I didn't want to get on the hype train, but Sydney Sweeney, who plays this character, and he goes, I was like, oh yeah, the one with like, the, the, the crazy, crazy big boobs. He's like, she gets them out of the show all the time. And I was like, are you serious? Called you for it? Yeah. <laughs> and it, and by the way, I, I don't need to disclaim this, but my manager's gay and he was praising these boobies. And he was like, Dude, even I, he's like, I was getting tingles. <laughs> and I was like, these boobs were that good? And he was like, that good, man. With the nipple placement was perfect. He's like, usually I see boobies and I'm like, ew. But these ones, I was like, wow, well, look at those things. And then, long story short, I've, I've downloaded every episode before <laughs> and I will be binging it with, with Georgia come, come, come tonight. I'm going to start tonight. Oh, yeah, out of respect to Euphoria and its, um, its equality. I think there's more dick in it than there is dick. Oh. I've heard of that. A lot of pain. There is a monologue which goes for a good, what do you reckon, seven or eight minutes? Where a fully grown man has his penis out the entire time. Is really? it a good looking dick though? I mean, we all know. I don't know. It's like it's not fucking, that's not big around the bush. Oh, hey, hey, hold on now. I wasn't uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I can admire a good dick, and that's progress. You know what I mean? We're not monsters. We can admire a good dick. You know what I mean? Hey, my last point before we move on. Yeah. Um, being typecast as a villain, villain, someone's hero. Because you know? he touched on before. Even Adolf Hitler thought well, he was doing the right thing. So he was, and he was a he was a crushing public speaker. It depends on perspective. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> villains for me, especially in the earlier stages, they're more three dimensional. You mentioned it. It's like villains. Sometimes you can play, you know, the leading protagonist and they, uh, they can be a bit two dimensional, you know, unless you really put the work in to find where they're a bit fucked up. Um, villains are more three dimensional, I find, you know, like Mystery Road, like it hasn't come out yet, but when you, when you watch it, because I assume you guys will be, right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I put the gun down now. Like, yeah, good, good. Uh, I got to add so much to it and like I didn't try, I tried not to make him just, just a guy that, I tried to make it a little bit nuanced and I tried to make him, you know, my brand of psycho was more, I'm not the physically intimidating guy, I'm more the one that I'm helping, you see me helping an old lady with their shopping, you're like, oh my God, is he going to kill this old lady? Yeah, What's it's it's uneasy, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. It's that moment in Chopper where he stabs the shit out of that guy and he's like, oh, are you all right? <laughs> it's like, oh, that's unsettling. It was that kind of brand. So it's, yeah, it is fun to play villains, man. And I used to early on be like, oh, I don't want to be typecast, I don't want to be typecast. But your froth coffee's long enough, you're like, well, someone typecast me, please! Get me out of here! I'll play the same thing a hundred times! Look at Liam Neeson, he's loving it. So where did the, um, where did the comedy 
peace come in for you? Yeah. Like, was it, a, was it something that you've always enjoyed? Was it a, a thing with the acting where you're like, oh, this could be an interesting offshoot? Or was it, did you just go to something and be like, oh, I could fucking do that? Oh, pretty funny. Yeah, well, there's a lot of that. Uh, yeah, it, it was born of frustration, to be honest, man. Like, I, I was feeling pretty frustrated. Like, uh, like I said, I was living in Sydney. Um, I was living in Sydney and then uh, come March 2020, I came back and COVID here and like everything just sort of like fell apart. The industry fell apart, the world fell apart. Uh, nothing was happening and I was what I, I felt like I was right on the precipice. Like I, I graduated drama school, I'd gotten great managers, I'd come so close on like some good projects and just hadn't had my shot and then fucking COVID hit and I was like, fuck. And it just kept lasting longer and longer and there's obviously worse sub stories out there with COVID, but I just was so frustrated and I just couldn't book anything and you know, I'm continually working casual jobs that I don't like and everyone's buying houses around me and I'm just like, what am I fucking doing? And I'd always thought about doing stand-up comedy, but my, the, the narrative I told myself was, I have a spicy sense of humor. I can't be getting up there telling them what I think's funny, because then when I book Riverdale, season five, they're gonna be like, we have footage of this guy making a joke about a guy in a wheelchair, or something yeah. along those lines. That was the self-important narrative. I was like, I'm gonna be so good, people are gonna be filming me immediately. And ultimately, I kind of hit this low point with acting where I went, it's not gonna, I just don't think it's gonna happen. And I'm not gonna quit, but what would I, what am I not doing right now because I think acting's gonna work out? And that was one of the things. I was like, well, why wouldn't I just do stand up then? Like, don't worry about getting cancelled, you're probably not gonna become an actor anyway. So just go and get up there and tell some jokes. And that's sort of what was, that's what led me to it. And then there was Raw Comedy Festival, uh, which is sort of the biggest open mic competition in the country. And they had finals coming up, I knew about it, it's the only thing I knew. So I threw my name in the hat for that and did my first night. So you had to do like a five minutes of comedy. And I wrote this five minutes, went up, did it, didn't get put through. They put like two people through to the next round. And then after the show, the judges that I spoke to me and were like, hey, listen, we're gonna put you through on like a wild card next time for the, for the next round. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then it happened again. But each time I went up, I did like a new five minutes because I just thought it was a talent show. I didn't realize that you like, they don't expect you to do that. You can just do the same five minutes each time and try and move up. Put it down. Yeah, and I was like, why would I do that? Like, but I already did that, it was funny. Like, let's just move on. So I just didn't know the rules. And I just kept writing a new five minutes and just kept getting put through, not officially, but behind closed doors. They were like, we put someone else through, but we're going through to the next round. I'm like, okay, okay, that's cool, whatever. Keep going through. And then come the grand final, this is only my fourth, fifth time ever doing stand up. And it's like a fucking sold out show at the comedy lounge down the road. And it's like, I don't know, it was like 200 people in there. Um, and I was fucking shitting myself. And John Pinder was the MC who I was to the podcast with. And was, I'd seen him before. I really fucking liked his comment. I thought it was really funny. And there's this little space between backstage and the stage. And he was sort of just back there, you know, doing his thing. And I just was so nervous. And I was like, man, John, it's good to meet you. I was like, I really like your comment. Any advice? And he was like, um, they've already picked their winner. He was like, just know that. They probably already picked their winner. This is just the beginning of your career. This means nothing. It's good. Like it's go have fun, man. Like just relax. Like just treat them, treat the audience like they're your friends. The stakes are low. Just know that how good you do probably isn't going to make an impact on your life and the competition as a whole. They've already picked their winner. And I was like, okay, controversial, but all right. And I went out and it fucking went so well. Just like just just crushed hard. It was like one of the first times I've ever felt that. And came off stage and even though I didn't win that immediate feedback, that meritocracy of doing well, and people saw it, like, even though I came second that night, when I was walking through the crowd to go get a drink, like, strangers were pulling me aside, and, like, were emotional, they were like, this is fucking bullshit, you know, this is, a, you, were, you were robbed, this is crazy, and I, people were so invested, and I'd spent years as an actor, getting super close on big projects, getting flown out for things, you miss out, no one knows. No, no one gives yeah. a shit. There's no evidence of it. And, right, and you just backed frothing lattes. And no one knows that you were getting driven around in a fucking Chrysler the week before, feeling like king shit, think, fantasizing about your new life because you're just about to be in this new show. And at least with comedy, I was like, even at the worst, if you, if you yeah, arguably get robbed or whatever, there's politics, the audience saw it and you get that feedback, you get that validation. To a little validation junkie like me, I was like, this is it, this is gonna be the thing. So that's where it started. And uh, yeah, just hit it off with John um, and then just started wanting to do more of it. So 
comedy has sort of become jujitsu in that sense to me, like a constant working pursuit. Like, yeah, and there is politics in comedy. Make no mistake, you know what I mean. There's a reason people think Hannah Gatsby's a great comedian. The truth. <laughs> uh, Aussie comedy is going to be like, you can't say these things. <laughs> All right, people. All right. So, but uh, you know, there are politics, but ultimately. There is a crowd and it is more of a meritocracy than a lot of other pursuits. If you crush and you build a, a fan base, you just, you can sort of become undeniable. You know, like a Louis CK, although what he did was pretty fucked up. It's like, he's still a great comedian. You know what I mean? You may not let him babysit, <laughs> but he tells jokes pretty good. And after all, like, you know, they tried to take him down fully and, you know, he, he, he suffered some consequences. But I mean, he's back when rings. And like he's doing his thing, so it offers this level of sovereignty that most other creative pursuits don't do. Um, I mean, that can, that became evident for me recently. Again, it kind of like because sometimes in my mind I can feel like, is it acting or comedy? And I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but I do fear there will be this point that arrives where it's like pick one. You know, like you see people like a Steve Carell, like or you know he he started out in stand up and he was really good, and then he was, like, I don't think he does stand up anymore. Or, there's very rarely people that are operating at the highest level that still do both, you know, because one skill tends to atrophy if you don't do it and, and yada yada. But it happened to me, uh, it occurred to me recently because of the whole, the whole Joe Rogan controversy. And when he got accused of misinformation initially, God, this is the best white straight guy pod ever. We're talking yes, about Joe, Joe Rogan vaccines and shit. Yeah. yeah, work culture. Come on! Let's We're marginalized out here, boys. Jordan Peterson's next. We'll talk about him next. Um, when he got accused of misinformation, I noticed The Rock like, spoke out in like, support of him and was like, I'm, I'm an advocate for free speech. Can't wait to come on the podcast and share some terror money, you know, by just promoting his shit. And, um, and then obviously the compilation came out of him saying the N-word and stuff like that, which was this big political hit job, but he took ownership of it. And uh, then The Rock just totally flipped his narrative and was like, oh, I wasn't aware of the full picture of Joe Rogan. I withdraw my support and all this stuff. And... She, I actually didn't see that. Yeah, he had like a, you know, people tagging me like, oh, you support this guy after he did this. I wasn't aware of the kind of person he was. I withdraw my support. And I have no doubt in my mind that, that The Rock actually thinks Joe Rogan's fine. Hmm. I have no doubt. But his business is so dependent upon appeasing the left, yeah. you know, and, and, his, and his image for, for largely, you know, uh, not very logical people. So... That was so interesting because The Rock is at the fucking top of the mountain. You know, he's not a great, he's not winning any Oscars anytime soon, you know, but he is, he owns his own production company. He's the highest paid actor in the world. He just like, you'd think that guy at the echelon of acting would be untouchable, could just say and do whatever he wants, but he can't. Mm -hmm. And I genuinely think he cannot because he's beholden to his employees, he's beholden to public image and all these types of things. And then Joe Rogan, who is in comedy and podcasting and things like that, has sovereignty. He has accountability because he wants to. But, you know, people have said, people try to take him down, he, he, he expresses his opinion. So that was interesting to me to sort of see that reflected that I thought, ooh, even in best case scenario, even I become The Rock, but with good acting, I still probably can't express my opinions. I still can't say the N word. This is not worth it. This is crazy. What am I doing this for? I'm going to become a comedian. <laughs> no, but I was like, you know, it is interesting that uh, even at the the, the peak of something where you have sovereignty and where you don't. Yeah, it's interesting that it seems like comedians in particular have found like the cheat code around cancel culture. Like Louis C.K., Dave Chappelle, even Chris Delia to a, to a degree. Yeah. Has, has, and they've all been cancelled, quote unquote, and I mean, Dave Chappelle just literally went, eh. Uh, nice accusations there. Yeah, Bang. that's right. Um, but, but Louis C.K. was literally dead and buried, mm -hmm. as was Dalia, and both of them now come back. It's, it's, it's You've strange. seen it's the first round of it, right? So they just go, it's like, how do you deal with it? And you see people go, oh, I'm going to go away for six months, or I'm going to go away for 12 months, and then they come back and people are like, yeah, okay, yeah. we'll keep listening. It's still fucked, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's built in, it, like, it's built in fan bases, it's built in audiences, it's, it's creating an ecosystem in which you uh, provide a service that people want to hear that's not beholden to, a, you know, like a public image that Hollywood runs, essentially. So that's something I'm pretty conscious of, like, you know, trying not to be, you know, in a confident way. Like, I believe if I have my due, I have a, I have the potential to, to go very far, but I have to be conscious of 
always conscious of where I'm at and is it worth compromising myself? I, I don't want to die on every hill. I genuinely don't care about some issues that I think, oh, that's pretty silly, but I just don't care. Yeah, but you're a very really honest, you, you come across as a very honest person and you're speaking your mind about topics in, in real time. It's like, you can't really be touched if you're doing that. You know, like if you're right. being very honest and real and connected with who you are, I'm also not scared to be wrong. Yes. And not, because I, I, I don't know if I've said it before on this, but like I, like being wrong, like discussing a topic and having an opinion on something and then seeing something that completely changes your opinion on it or makes you go, oh, I'm not an idiot. Yeah. It's one of the best feelings as an adult that I've had, like where, where like your ego is challenged and you actually are like, oh, I'm very much wrong here. Yeah. Like that's a, it's a beautiful thing to happen because it makes you realize that you aren't standing, like you're not blindly in service of your own like, like identity essentially. Yeah. And there's a lot more opportunity for that if people don't attack you. Yeah. Which I think is a common method. It's well, like, it's very hard. To, if, if you're being attacked, it's very hard to take on board what people are saying because you yeah. just immediately put the fences up. I mean, again, to show my ugly side, it happened to me not long ago. Um, I don't know if I told you this, Josh, but like I was going into spud shit. Did I say this? No, I did. Oh, fuck. I mean, here's an example of being attacked and not being your best self. Like, I'm, I'm the guardian to my little sister. I'm, of all the things I've tied to my identity, one that is pretty hard to untangle is the fact that I'm very protective of my younger sisters and like my parents have always had problems with addiction and, and things like that. So like I've always felt that I've had to step up and be that role for my sisters, even just internally. But so you're the guardian for your sister? Yeah, yeah. Well, not not to the twenty two year old one. She's she's old enough to obviously um, do her own thing. But currently, my thirteen year old sister lives with me and. Uh, Still has a relationship with, with my mum and dad, but like just the situation that be that would be a very nice, deep and dark podcast. A separate one is, is, is sort of led to that situation. But uh, I'm very, very protective of my sisters. And we went to Spud Shed just to buy some stuff. This was maybe a few weeks ago. And uh, my sister's 13. So at the time, I didn't realise Mark McGowan had changed the rules. But the initial, one of the rounds of rules that he made up was that like 13 year olds and under didn't have to wear a mask. So we went to the shops and walking through Spud Shed and like I had my mask on, my sister didn't. And as we're like approaching the shop, you can sort of see the cash, like the, the registers and stuff. This, I'm just going to describe her, not in a judgy way, but this larger woman screamed out, you know, um, where's her mask? And we're still meters away from the shop. A shopper or a worker? No, a worker. Yeah. Like at the, at the register. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If it was a worker, it would have been, been bloodshed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I should preface that. Yeah, she worked there. And she called out, where's her mask? And um, I sort of was like, oh. And like I looked down at my sister and I kind of realized she was talking about her. And I was like, oh, she's 13. She doesn't, she doesn't need one. And she's like, no, rules have changed. Where's, she needs a mask now. And we haven't even entered the store yet. And I saw on my sister's face that she was, because people were looking, this woman was yelling from meters away um, as we were about to the store. I saw my sister get kind of really embarrassed and like, oh, maybe we should go sort of thing. And something fucking primal set up in me. And it, I was not my best self, I will disclaim this, but I went full high school. I was like, shh, don't yell, shut up, you're fat. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you're fucking fat. You, like, you, you care about health? I just started going on a full fat tirade and just like screaming back at this woman and it was so, <laughs> I wouldn't say funny, but everyone had sort of stopped to listen to the altercation and as soon as they heard fat, they just moved on, they were like, oh he said fat, keep moving, keep moving, get his heads down, he said fat, holy shit. And I just screamed at this woman and uh, yeah, it wasn't at my best self, but I, I just was so triggered, you know, I was like, don't fucking scream out and like embarrass my 13 year old sister. and the security guard sort of like walked towards me and I genuinely in my head was like, I would punch on <laughs> this Indian security guard just doing his job because I called a woman fat. I know it would be super hard to explain this to someone, you know? There is something about your sisters. Oh, like, bro. She's yeah. one, I've got one who's, uh, she's only two years younger than me, but she's always been like, she's always been tiny and always been picked on. She had a 21st birthday and invited all these people and of, of the few people that actually showed up, this dude decided to take half a car and like two six packs of beers out of the esky and take them as roadies. And I was like, in my head, like you, something just flipped. And I was like, I don't mind if you take a beer or two for the road. Yeah, sure. Go and thing, nightclub, whatever, take a couple of beers and roadies, take half a carton 
and you're taking the fucking piss. Yeah, yeah. And I fucking flipped. I screamed. Like, I didn't know my oh, yeah. voice went it gets to that. Yeah, it gets Yeah, I screamed at this man. I knocked the beers out of his hand. I picked him up by the scruff of his shirt and his belt. And our garden was like two tiers of limestone walls. <laughs> I threw him. Superhuman the... brother strength. Yeah. Threw him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> off. There's something that flips in your brain. Yes. Especially like with your situation. If you're like the primary caregiver essentially. Yeah. I couldn't even fathom what that's like. Yeah. But I fucking, I back that. Yeah, I, but I will say, um, <laughs> in terms of accountability, my manager spoke to me about this and he has three young daughters and he was, because I was talking to him, I was like, do you believe in this toxic masculinity, man? What the, what is this? Is there toxic femininity? Isn't it just like there's, there's assholes and there's, you know, like, is there such a thing? And, uh, I mean, I won't get into it, but he was talking about the little Smith slap and stuff like that. And I was like, you know, I, violence is never just, I was like, he took it from a verbal place to a physical place. It was just, I was expressing my opinions and he kind of, he brought it to this place. He goes like, look, you know. I understand it, I get that whole protective thing, and he goes, but I want my daughters to, if they're ever in physical danger, because that was my argument, I said, if, I think it's, violence is justified if you're in physical danger. Like if, if Chris had started coming down throwing haymakers at Jader, I'm like, yeah, well, you got to yeah. step in and do something. But he goes, I want my daughters to, and wouldn't you want your sister to be the type of person who someone throws some verbal abuse to their way and they can fucking throw it back? You know, if they're not in physical danger and stand up for themselves. And if I was, and I was like, again, he approached it with love. He didn't attack me about it. So I was like, man, that's true. Like I, I do, and I, I make a conscious effort to make my sisters the type of people who are, you know, not brittle spirits mm. and could stand up on their own two feet and be like, you know, that they could call that woman fat, not me. You know, that would make me proud. It's and funny that we <laughs> depress. Like, I think everyone is just as a human being. Like, when you're pressed, when someone presses on something that's sore or that you're protective of, you just like, quick scan, what's the lowest hanging fruit here? Oh, dude. Attack. And it worked. <laughs> like, I could have, I could have, like, all logic, I, I felt my brain skip over all of it and be like, attack that she's fat. Just fat shame her, dude. It'll kill, it'll, it'll win. And it, it, it sadly did. This is not a PSA to say call people fat to win arguments, but. Boy, it was effective. It shows as well, though, like, we are, we're all on edge right now. Yeah, true. We're primed. It's like, you leave the house, you're like, okay, I got my fucking mask. What day is it? It's Thursday. I have to wear a mask after five. Okay, so I've got the mask. But mm -hmm. I've got this, I've got that. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to go. I've got my keys, I've got my fucking bag, I've got my daughter, my sister. Let's go. And then you forget one thing, you're like, fuck. And you feel like you're being called out publicly, exactly, shamed, and you're exactly, like, all right. Exactly. It's like, I'm a good person. Yeah, that kind of was it. I follow the fucking rules. Yeah. She's 13. I would have just said, she's fucking 11. Fuck off. Yeah, I changed <laughs> it. I'm not going to get my birth certificate. Exactly. What are you going to do? Ask a fucking ID? Eat a dick. I'm trying to be less, like, less, not less reactive to people, but like, more of a relaxed person. Yeah. Within myself. In it's so easy. Ways. Yeah, it's so easy to just be like, the, 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 the natural state is to be like, stressed out and pissed off. Yeah. I don't know where that, that, that happened in my life, but that's, that seemed to be the thing where it's like, you know, people will be like, how are you doing? And you'll be like, oh, I'm so fucking busy, or I'm this and that. It's like, it's all negative. Like, yeah. And I started recognizing that the people that I sort of enjoy their time the most of, like, they're kind of funny and they're just having a good time and they're like, yeah. hey, it's just, shit happens. So you try and think about the things that are going to actually, things that are worth really like, Roaring for and things that aren't. Obviously, you've got sister technical all of those things, so it makes yeah. perfect sense. But I find like since I've been trying to be a little bit more mindful of that, I'm being mindful not in like a fucking work spiritual way, but just thinking about it and going, oh, yeah. I can change these these ways. You can actually just sort of check yourself in the morning and be like, you know, today could be a fucking funny day, or like this stressful thing that's happening. Is, is not going to be there forever. Yeah. Whether I'm working at a big contract at the moment and one of the other creative directors, I'm the creative director of this, this big contract and I was working with another guy and the uh, the CEO just got online on one of the chats and was like demanding progress. It's like, I'm paying a bunch of fucking money, this isn't happening, what's going on? Sounds very it's CEO like, of... Oh, yeah, but it was like respect to it. It's like he should sure. do, the dude's juggling a lot of things. So yeah. I can see where he was coming from. Um, and then I spoke to the other dude and he was like, oh man, like, did you see he was like really stressed out? I was like, dude, this, 
I've seen like three other chats this guy's in. He's like joking about other stuff. Like he's using that anger to get to get shit done. Yes. Tactic. Yes. You you can either take that on and be like, oh, I need to I need to get this done. And like suddenly you're carrying around a bag of stress with you, or you can just be like, if someone else is angry or someone else is upset. There's still a there's still a problem and a solution. Like it, no matter how much you take that problem on board, yeah, and let it affect you or like let it affect you in the moment, it's not going to help you get to the solution. Yes, and you you do have a choice to just not not react, not react in that space because it doesn't make any sense to anyone. Yeah, I think because I can empathize. I'm trying to empathize on on both ends, but I don't think I empathize with myself enough um, to be like, all right, man. You know, like we talk about that being loving and don't attack yourself. Like, I, I need to love myself more. No, it was. It's more. You know, when I, if I saw a woman now, I'd apologize. I hundred percent would. Like that wasn't okay. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have caught your body image. I'm sorry. I was being very defensive of my sister. It wasn't. It's not justified. Um, and that's because yeah, like I empathize with myself and go, I know what that was, and that's not the best reflection of me. You know, and I think we just need more of that. I just think we need less attacking of people and more empathizing and. One positive with the whole like Will Smith slap Chris Rock debate was that I kind of articulated in my mind that yeah I really do even though I have a lot of friends who are professional fighters and and, and I do combat sports for the for lack of a better term ju- violence is never justified unless you're in physical danger that's just my that's just my kind of mantra you know like if you are in physical danger yeah violence is to nullify the situation as best as possible with reasonable force I do think it is justified but running it through that lens and that filter of I don't need to become physical or even even abusive if I'm not in physical danger. Like if someone's abusing me verbally and I'm not in danger, I, I don't even need to react, mm. you know? But as soon as it steps into the realm of like, okay, now this person might attack me physically and harm me, then I can start calling people without, I guess. You know, getting the hands up, coming after the body image. I'm like, I'm in danger. I'm in danger. <laughs> and I'm attacking with words. Yeah, they could spin and heel kick me from here. All right, time to come up with their love handles. <laughs> spinning anything. Yeah, well, don't be spinning me. Cabana Brown that I'm, I'm blanking. So what's moves now? Like, are you are you making a move back over it? That's a good question, man. I think you know for the. For the short term, while my sister is living with me, that is just sort of a non-negotiable. Um, so I will make the best of the situation. Like, and I'm happy here, man. Like, you know, I am happy. Like, I've got, I'm comfortable, you know. And uh, I've got my partner. I've got, you know, my friends, my jiu-jitsu, all those kinds of things. I'm very content. I'm living a good life and I'm aware of it. But I think once that is no longer the situation where I am beholden to taking care of my sister, um, then I will start to consider going to a place where I am, I just feel less shitty and I feel like I see more of myself reflected back at, you know, where there is more opportunity. I also think that over the last two years, because I have made this personal growth in not needing to be this idea of an actor, like just wanting to actually enjoy the process of it, the stakes are a lot lower for me and I think I'm in a much better headspace to to take on the next stage of, of, of putting myself in a bigger city or something like that because I'm not going to fall into these traps, hopefully, unless the millions of dollars are offered and then I'll just become anything they want. But uh, until that point, yeah, I guess, you know, to make a long story long, I'll, I'll wait until the situation with my sister resolves itself and then I'll look at probably Sydney, maybe yeah. Melbourne, um, most likely Sydney. And, you know, I listen to too much Joe Rogan, so I just think that LA is just homeless people running around stabbing each other. But uh, I'm not too sure how that how that's going because it that looks, was a great place too. It looks pretty mind. wild. I mean, I I went and lived there in 2009 and I was right in the peak of the GFC, so there was like okay an insane amount of homeless people. There. Did you yeah. see the Instagram thing I sent you? Know that street people in Los Angeles? Yeah. Um, like I watched a documentary on it on Netflix the other day as oh, well. Oh shit! Which it's it's wild. Like it's it's yeah. it, it really is wild. But I mean, Skid Row has been Skid Row for a long time. Skid yeah. Row's fucking like spread everywhere. <laughs> Like, yeah, but it, it always was. Like it's, it's just like a hundred and fifty, um, hundred and fifty city blocks now. Fuck, dude. It's fucking insane. Yeah, and like there was like typhus and shit. It was like medieval diseases what? coming out of there and stuff. Like stuff that like, yeah, stuff that hasn't that. been there. It's like such a damp. Well, it's like fucking like, like, There's not like I've been there a lot. Like it's it's there's businesses operating out of there upstairs, and then you come down and it looks like The Walking Dead. It's fucking crazy. I remember going there with Bradshaw, and he was like. What was wrong with that dude? I was like, that was a crackhead. 
Like, are they, it's, it's, are they shooting sad. something along here? Is like looking for the cameras and stuff? He's like, it's crazy. Oh, like, really cancer. just like leathery skin and yeah, just look like kind of aliens. So it's, it's definitely pretty hardcore. But I don't know. I, I don't know how fucking bad it is. You need to remember as well, Joe Rogan's like a fucking 58 year old man. Oh, for sure. Dude, like, trust me, I always do, like, a, 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 like a self-disclaimer before I listen to any Joe, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm always just like, alright, this is just this dude. Because like, I, I, I may, to be honest, I mainly listen to the ones, I just don't listen to the ones with him and comedians. Mm. Like, I just love when he's fucking around. I'm not actually overly interested in science and shit. That's kind of why I'm doing all the creative stuff. But I just want to hear him fucking around, having fun with friends. That's actually my favourite podcast. Why I listened to you guys initially was it's like, I just want to hear friendship. I just want to hear all yeah, the conversations over friendship. I don't really want to, I don't really care about information too much. Clearly. Man, and, and nor are that many people in a position to give too much fucking wisdom on, on topics. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, you can just hear like, people just talk shit and have opinions. Yeah, there was one thing fun. that really, uh, there was one episode of the podcast that you guys did, which I was listening to, and I think I messaged you, and I was like, man, the first like 40 minutes of this was just like, talking to you? Yeah, it was weird. It was like you guys were some sort of a fucking algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But you'd said something about it where you were like eliminating the concept of um, should need and want. Yeah. And that was a, I was like, that's crazy. Because later in that podcast, you're like, you said, oh yeah, I'm nearly 30. And I was like, oh, you wise motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I just, I've, I, yeah, I mean, again, I just, I think I saw, I just, I saw so much pain in my family and especially in my parents just, and I, I brought it, I boiled it down to just delusion. It just would not. You know, like I love my parents and I empathize much as they can. They have me when they were 18 years old, you know, so like they were just kids. And um, I love them as the human beings they are, but so much of the ailment I could boil down to this one central idea of it's they just could not be honest with themselves and like delusion and deal with pain. So I almost have this hyper, you know, I have this hyper um, vigilant side of myself where I'm always looking for as much accountability as possible and like I, I just hate any time I feel a victim mentality in myself you know which is kind of why I've, I've loved being around people like Rod and Jack and stuff people who just don't make excuses they are self-deprecating they laugh at themselves they don't take life overly seriously but they're fiercely passionate and they don't have a victim mindset so yeah I just I'm always thinking about that stuff but when I was getting to the that particular episode the victim voice was super loud and I was like all right we will what are we doing here? I need to think of something. And I think it's actually Eckhart Tolle that says that, like getting rid of the false self, avoid, should, need, and have to. And it's just reframing, it's, it's reframing each of those ideas, right? Yeah, getting back to that. It's like appeasing the inner brat within yourself. You're like, you don't have to. It's like, well, then I will. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to eat the broccoli and go to work. And it's like, all right, well, I will if I don't have to. But if you tell me I have to. And that, and that was something else I realized with COVID. It's like, I already don't like being told what to do. Think the world has been told what to do by their governments and we're in this hypersensitive state to be told what you can and cannot do even within yourself so when you tell yourself you can't have that beer but you're like don't tell me what to do you're mm-hmm. telling me what to do Miguel I'm telling me what to do and you just have a, you end up having a beer so we have such a strange friend. relationship with that as well because like for our entire generation we've been told we can do anything yeah, well, that's fine. You, can do, you can do anything. Yeah, but it's like, you know, like you can do it, anything, you can be anything, like, you know, dream, believe, succeed, all that sort of shit. Exactly. And then it's like, <laughs> then it's like, yeah, get vaccinated, <laughs> or you can't work anymore, you can't do this and that. Yeah. It's, I don't think it's like the vaccination, I think it's like the hard line of, no, you have to do this, Yeah. and the other things you can, like, you can even think, like they say, like, death and taxes, all right? You, Not always you can science. get away from fucking... Yeah, you can, if you get a crafty accountant, yeah. you can get away with not paying, it's like, oh, I need to pay like a full tax, things like that. It's like, there's loopholes for everything. Sure. And suddenly like, this hard line thing comes down and goes, this is what's happening. And people were like, I don't like being told what to do. It's just like, it's just part of who I am. It's yeah. Like, oh, so am I. We kind of have been growing up that way. Like, yeah. Dude, I went on a virtual rant in my own head against Mark McGowan today. Two nights ago, I'm going out for training because I got flashbacks for the camera. <laughs> it's like, you son of a bitch. You revenue raising motherfucker. You can't even fix our fucking hospitals, but you can put a million dollars of fucking smart cameras on the oh, fucking yeah. freeway. I know the exact camera too, dude. Before, just for the Canning Highway, whatever. Yeah, the bridge, yeah. The little, oh, you might not actually. Are you thinking of like no, the. No, I don't mind. It's like a little tablet almost. It looks like up top at the yes. 80k zone. 
Yes! Yeah. There's two, there's two though, two videos. Yeah. So there's one at Canyon Highway, one just before the Narrows. Yes. And uh, I got done in the 100 zone. Oh wow, okay, nice. Moving. I've seen your car, that's hard not to do it. Hard not to do 100. Your boy was coming back from yeah. training, you yeah, yeah. jacked up. Jacked. <laughs> there was someone in the right hand lane. Let's spend some money on driver education, because this country will be doing 90 in the fucking right lane. So then we this red. Yes, you go! Your wine pack. No, no, you could. When he finally decided to move. <laughs> I accelerated past him. Oh god, that would have been. A, can you imagine though how like that moment for him? Oh, he's like, this guy's on my ass. I'm doing a hundred. Doesn't matter the right hand. You blast past him into a flash. He would have been like, oh. and I think that's what pissed me off. Yeah, the you most. knew. It's like you son of a bitch. You're gonna be laughing in your fucking Hyundai gets. And then I was like in my head, you know what? Fuck it. I'll pay the four hundred dollars because that was worth it. Four <laughs> hundred? I don't know. I was twenty k's over. What is it now? Probably four thousand dollars. <laughs> Four thousand and another booster. <laughs> <laughs> another one. Yeah. The other arm. But yeah, I fucking got mad because the you know all the shit they could be spending money on it cost a million dollars. And you know what? Those cameras aren't even sending out fines yet. I still got mad. I'm not gonna get a fine. But I still got mad. Oh, that's interesting because I did get flashed by that same thing not long, like a while ago, and I never got anything. Yeah. So I was like, maybe it's maybe that was a lightning bolt. They're still in testing. Interesting. And they're they set work. Up, they're set up to um to capture your phone as well. So if the little camera sees you like with a device in your hand, don't have a fucking nose. Wow. Facial recognition or some shit. It flashes and you get fine for that as well. But yeah, I just it's just fucking. Do you consider that you're maybe just like you know mad at yourself? Maybe. Maybe, maybe that's right. Like, maybe maybe you're a car. I can't yeah, yeah. drive. <laughs> 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 you're yeah. driving and you get flashed and you're like Mark McGowan's fault. <laughs> I'm not, I'm gonna take like no party party this. Josh. I love you. But maybe you shouldn't have spent <laughs> <laughs> No, I get you, I get you, man. Yeah, so that's something that I've been working on is it's just I'm sensitive to being told what to do, I'm aware of it even within myself, so I just reframe things I don't need to do them. But do you still want to do it? Mm. Mm. And it's crazy what you actually want to do. And that's a narrative that that we're told from a young age, especially as actors, you don't get to do what you want to do. You just don't. Like you have to do things. You don't, you know, and there is truth to that, but I also think that no one taps you on the shoulder at a certain point and goes, guess what, you did it. You can do what you want yeah. now. You know, so you have to make that decision within yourself. You have to sort of just accept the consequences and start uh, spoken with true white privilege and just do whatever you want. <laughs> well, at least push There's your no... own, yeah, push, push your own sort of, uh, forge your own path through these things, right? Absolutely. And like, I mean, even with Matthew McConaughey, there was that thing he told recently, which was, it doesn't sound inspiring because it's Matthew McConaughey, but he was talking about obviously when he was the rom-com guy and uh, he wanted to do other things and they were like, don't, you know, do, do Ghosts of Girlfriends Past 2, please. And uh, he just said no, and like he didn't get a job for two years, whatever, which again, not, not overly inspiring, but uh, I'm sure he dropped from black caviar to regular caviar, would have been upsetting to him. And uh, the first thing that came up was True Detective. You know, and it was a TV show, and like it wasn't that long ago that like there was still this narrative that there are movie actors and TV actors, yeah, yeah. And him and Woody Harrelson just kind of doing what they want. It wasn't the good business move. No one was saying do it. He's like, I like this character. This show looks cool. Me and my mate are gonna do it. And they were like, I wouldn't do it, Matt. We've got fourteen million dollar offer for you know this other rom com. And he's like, oh, I'm just gonna do it. And it fucking changed the industry. How fucking good was that season? It's outrageous. And then how bad were the so following time? Oh god, I love yeah. Vince Vaughn, but I did not mind. I, oh, boy, me and oh, a friend were so invested in season one, and we had this discussion about season two, and he's like, I reckon Vince Vaughn is going to suck in this. I'm like, no, I Impossible. reckon he is, I reckon he's going to fucking nail this. I reckon he's going to his thing. And he came out, and it was a fucking dust up. Yeah, it was a dust. And I think that, yeah, I guess the lesson from that was it's just like, do what you want. Just or do rom coms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do rom coms and then do what you want. And I don't think it's because he was at this point of flexing. I just think that he made the decision to just do what he wanted. And no one could have predicted that that would have changed the industry. And now you see TV shows, they've all got massive actors in them. You know, they're just, they're just adherent to this, to the content. If the content's good, they'll do it. So. Hopefully I change the industry in some way, guys. I think you just need to do what you do. It's in, in any creative pursuit or in any pursuit in life. It's like, do you want to be, like, do you want to seat at the table? Like, do you want to be an actor? Or do you want to be a musician? Or like, do you want to 
be at that seat where you're like, this is like I'm accepted amongst this, or do you want to like be yourself and be someone who acts, like you were saying, like yeah. it's like you know, like forge, forging your own path. The, I think so. The tough one with things like Matthew McConaughey. Have you listened to Matthew McConaughey's book? Dude, I can't. I, I can't just because I actually don't like Matthew McConaughey. Man, but I, that's I've said it on here before. He's a fucking liar. Like I mean, that he, he drinks his own Kool Aid pretty hard. Like it's it's too indulgent for me. Like yeah. my tall. I don't think I have tall poppy syndrome. Oh, it comes out when I hear Matthew talk. He's like. His Oscar speech did it for me about, he's like, I'm my own hero in 10 years' time. And I was just like, your hero? Come on, dude. You can't say that. You know, like, I look full, like, Aussie farmer on him. Like, ah, oh, fucking sit down. It's a monologue. Like, everything he does is a monologue. Yeah. And, and he's, still, he's like, man, he's telling these insane... Have you read the book? No. He's telling these insane stories about, like, his dad being a superhero and him waking him up in the middle of the night and driving him, like, across the state so that he could piss over some other dude's head to win a motorbike and like... You and the monologue you're just listening to it just going, well that's just not true, like that's a ridiculous story, it's not true. And it's like, okay, well like we can we can bend stories and you can, you know, embellish things. Yeah. But it just keeps going on like that, like for fucking the whole first three chapters. And I was like, I don't want to sit here and listen to someone just fucking lie. The yeah. monologue comes from the fact that people in have clearly indulged him and yet, for the but yes man mm. around him for years and he now expects that that's the norm for him he speaks and people listen and that comes out in the way that he writes and the way that he talks yeah true we have created that one, so. we created him. i think and like, it leads to decisions like true detective but i just hope that i can yeah, i hope we can just balance it you know which i do think you have from something like jujitsu i think if matt mcconaughey did jujitsu bold statement I think if he was getting his head fucking smashed in every day and just cross face to oblivion, I don't think he would have written the book the way he did. I think he still would have done True Detective, yeah, but humanity, I think he would have yeah. been like, you know what, I was lying about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think he would have, so... Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just Scott, personally. <laughs> that's a terrible map, I can't That's what I want, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's it, man. Back to the drawing board for me. I mean, I've, I've made peace with the fact that if I don't become an actor, I don't become a, a comedian, Still got my sleep fighting partner, and life's gonna be good, and I'm gonna be happy, and I'm gonna have good people around me. So, yeah, you it's all cherries. Foundation. It's all cherries from here. So. You also might not have her after she hears you describing her. As so true. Your current sleep fighting. <laughs> Snoring. I'm gonna. Sleep she's fighting. not well right now. I'm going home to her, and I'm gonna take. Uh, you know, I'm gonna bring her some soup and do some nice, some nice. Don't things. worry. This won't come out until Monday week, so you've got time to really, to really schmooze her. Exactly. Really schmooze. Start tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I go home and watch a CrossFit documentary. God, this sport's cool, babe. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I must, I must I you. <laughs> Can you do that? <laughs> I respect I this you. enough. Get I eye contact. respect you. <laughs> yes. Look at me. Look at me. I love you. I love the hell out of you. I love you, but more than that. <laughs> I, respect <laughs> I respect you. I'm doing it to me, so now you've ruined that as well. I mean, <laughs> that's the podcast too. Hey, no, you know what? We could we'd be over a few weeks. Yeah, and and you know, now you got two weeks of that, and she'll be like, man, this is crazy. This is such a great guy. This is my forever partner. And then we'll come out and just be word for word or the podcast. I'm back at the cafe like, boys, I lost my foundation. I better work something sooner, I'm gonna kill you. Oh, that's good. Well, thanks for having me on, man. It was oh, super dude, fun, right? Long overdue. And I hopefully uh, we will individually get you on. Dude, it's so yeah. cool because we've spoken about you on here and John so many times. Hey, you gotta you gotta shout out in our latest episode too. We're even in the scoreboard oh, here. Oh, We're yeah, in the scoreboard, boys. listen up. Yeah, there's a lot of hand jobs going around. Yeah, yeah boy. Boy. <laughs> it's not talking about the universe, man. It just brings people together. You put it out there and people come. That's it's it. fucking great. Love what you do, Blake. Love you. Thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate you. Likewise. Thank you. Peace.